So we have the pleasure today to have with us uh, Sai Manor. Sai Manor is a professor at the Technical University in Israel. Uh, he's also a member of the Machine Learning uh, uh, Center in Israel. Um, yeah. The mic is working for uh, recording. Uh, am I too, but if I am too, um, you cannot hear me well? Yeah. Do you want me to come to hear the center? Is it better? Great. Sai is going to stay over there, though. Uh, but I'm sure that he has a loud voice, and uh, yeah. So, OK, Sai is a professor at the Technical University. It's a real pleasure to have him with us. Uh, Sai has been uh, before with McGill University in Canada uh, as, a, as a faculty member. And before that, he was also at MIT in Leeds uh, as a faculty, uh, as a Fulbright scholar. Uh, we have followed uh, Sai's work for quite some time now, and we're very happy to have him with us to talk to us about what he does. Welcome. Can you hear me in the back? All right. Is the recording OK? Yes. Good. So uh, um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I have a triple affiliation, which you'll see here, Technion. Uh, that's my university where I teach. Uh, NVIDIA, because of reasons that you'll hear, you'll understand soon. And Jethro Energy, which I'll explain to you in the very last uh, slide. So I asked uh, Jalal, what should I talk about? And should I bring uh, exotic machine learning? And he said, no, no, make it useful. So um, if, if I make it useful for you, then the praise goes to Jalal. If it's not, then it's my, uh, it's my fault. Um, who here took a class in machine learning? Or roughly half. OK, so, so the goal of, of this uh, presentation is built on in several layers. So, the, so this, is, um, uh, this is a, a, course, a, a short course about navigating the waters of machine learning. And, uh, and, and it's going to be mostly about machine learning, less about renewable energy. And the reason is that I think that you, I mean, often even if you take classes in an engineering department, it's a bit outdated. So I want us uh, to, to sort of to tell you about what's uh, happening uh, in the field. Um, you have the slides, there are some sources. Some of the, of the, of the equations are taken from the first uh, source, from uh, uh, the course by machine learning by, by my friend Hal Down. Um, and there are other references here which are good, all online. There are many courses uh, um, out there. So, so this course is really about navigating the, I wouldn't know if high waters or shallow waters, but the waters of machine, uh, of machine learning. Okay, so, so the, I mean, the f I, I built it as, as, as five units. And, and we can go deeper or not in the six hours that we have today. Um, the, the first one is general framework. This is going to be uh, what I'm going to talk about immediately now. This is really going to tell you about how I view the field, nothing about renewable energy. Then I'm going to, we have uh, three units. Uh, the first unit is about algorithms. Uh, if, if anything, if you go to sleep, you have to listen to the first unit. Uh, okay, this unit. About, it's about really what you, should, you must know if you want to be an engineer working in the you know, 21st century and using machine learning. You have to know that. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about models that are more advanced. I'm not going to give you a, a full uh, lecture about neural networks. Uh, this could be a whole course on its own, maybe even more than one. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about extra time uh, depending. My own, my own pet, uh, uh, pet uh, machine learning technology is, re is reinforcement learning. I'm not sure how much time I will have to talk about that. And then finally, I'm going to talk about renewable energy. So what are, what are the issues in, in, in about energy uh, in, in particular? And the way you should think about it is that I'm going, going to give you a taste. So this is like uh, going to, uh, to a restaurant and having a 12-course menu. Whether it's a Michelin or you know, not, you'll decide uh, uh, at the end. But this is like going to a restaurant and getting a, a, just a, a bite of different things. Okay. So let's talk about machine learning. This is uh, the, the formal definition. Uh, machine learning or AI, I, I make no distinction between the two. Okay, this is my own personal, I don't think there is a real big difference. Uh, but you know, some people uh, uh, would uh, kill me for saying that. Um, I, I, that's the classical definition from the 50s. That's a more modern definition from, uh, uh, by Rob Shapiri. 
um, the system that do stuff with data or, or observations. This is really what machine learning is about, and we're going to talk about what is this do stuff. So this is a classical example. Um, I have uh, data, uh, training data, probably a lot of samples, and here I need to, uh, I have a, um, a model, that's, uh, think about it, this is a neural network in this example, and then uh, I need to decide whether it's, uh, uh, what is the right label, human face, dog, cat, and so forth. So this is the, the training phase. Hopefully I have a lot of trained data, a lot of data trained with, with labels. And then during inference or testing time, I get some more samples, usually uh, much smaller. And then I need to decide, well, what is, what is it? In this case, this is a human face, so I'm, this is the right, uh, the right label. Okay, so um, there is a lot of hype around machine learning, but uh, um, all the examples here are from the 90s, from the 1990s, to be, if it's not clear. So this is uh, um, Amazon Search, uh, then we have Google AdWords, um, this is uh, the zip code, the US zip code, um, and uh, last but not least, uh, backgammon. So those are the examples where superhuman performance was achieved by machine learning. So, I mean, this has happened almost 30 years ago. Okay, so this is, uh, the, and the question is why the hype today? Because I'm sure that uh, you've all heard about the overhyping of, uh, of machine learning. Uh, so where are we now in, from a, an, a historical perspective? So uh, this is what's known as the third spring of AI. AI was invented in the 50s. It was a project uh, at MIT summer school, more or less like here. Beginning of the summer, they said, well, you know, there is this problem. How do you get you superhuman intelligence? We'll solve it by the end of the summer. Um, didn't quite happen. So uh, um, there, there, from a historical perspective, um, there were um, uh, two, um, two, uh, uh, two springs uh, before the, the winters. Uh, but I think, or other people think at least, uh, uh, that this time it's different. And the reason that there is a real ec an economic value uh, in machine learning. There is, a real, there is a real money to be made. And especially uh, machine learning dominates fields like uh, natural language processing, image understanding, speech recognition, and game playing. Note that renewable energy is not here. Yes, this is why you are here. So if you want to solve uh, an image understanding problem uh, and you're not using machine learning, uh, then you're not doing something right. I mean, you're, you're behind the, uh, the curve. Okay, so uh, what changed? So, so in principle, nothing changed. So there, is, there, hasn't, there haven't been any, uh, I would say, major development in theory. There, nothing was invented. Uh, neural networks were the deeper shell uh, happen, were, were known before, in the, in the 80s, in the 90s. And just to, to, to make sure that we understand what a what neural network is, it's a network of many elements. Uh, millions or even, even billions, um, you get an input layer. In this case, uh, there is, it's an image, and then there are hidden layers which uh, take uh, usually very simple operations, either linear or nonlinear, but very simple operations. And then there is an output layer which is going to be um, 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 go going to be the uh, um, uh, what you're trying in this case classification, your 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 classifier. Okay, but why that? Uh, and that's sort of the reason that I'm at Nvidia. Uh, the reason that this is, uh, uh, has exploded is because of gamers. So there is something known as GPUs, gra graphic processing units, and it turns out, by coincidence, that GPUs are very good for training large neural networks. Uh, and this was, uh, is uh, one of those uh, things that happened in history that uh, uh, someone realized that this can happen and, and therefore we can uh, train huge neural networks very efficiently as long as you have a lot of labeled data. So from a, a historical perspective, the gamers are to, to thank here as well. And if you're a gamer, then thank you. Uh, and then around 2012, so about 10 years ago, uh, basically the, re the revolution started. And the re revolution is a revolution of, of being able to use uh, GPUs like this to super efficiently train uh, very large uh, neural networks. Okay, just to um, uh, show the numbers of, uh, of participants that before COVID, uh, the number um, more than uh, uh, um, oh, increased by sixfold from 2013 to 2019. A lot of people are working uh, uh, in the field. There's a lot of, uh, of hot air. Uh, some of it is probably not justified. Uh, it's, you know, it's up at dinner. If you ask me, I'll tell you how much of it is not. Okay, uh, there, there are major three, problem, three families of learning problems. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Um, I'll, I'll focus in this course mostly on supervised learning, but uh, we will touch the other uh, two as well. 
Um, and, and now I'm just going to give you a very short preview of, of what, is, uh, uh, what are those problems. Okay, so supervised learning, I give you, you want to have a mapping from input to output. This example, I'll give you there are pictures of cats, there are pictures of dogs, and then I'm going to give you another picture and ask you cat, dog, or something else. Um, usually, uh, pretty, pretty, a pretty natural problem. It's a highly studied problem for many years with many algorithms. There are many variants. Uh, binary, cats or dogs. Uh, Multi-class, cats, dogs, parrots, ferrets, you name it. Uh, and there is, of course, regression. For example, price of electricity tomorrow. Um, there are, the output can be deterministic. I can say that the price is going to be 25 euros uh, per megawatt, or I can, it can be probabilistic. I can tell that there is going to be a curve around this number. So it's a highly studied problem, and, and this is the sort of the classical workflow that most of you will have to deal with, um, and that's uh, uh, basically you, you get data, um, you uh, uh, clean the data, you transform it, you, you shape it, um, and then you split it to two, the test data and the, the training data. Now you have a, a model training and building and model testing loop, so you do it many times. And uh, then some, it's occasionally you, 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 uh, um, uh, you look at the test data, if you're happy, you deploy it. Your boss shouts at you why it doesn't work, and then you go back to uh, uh, get asking for more data. Um, this is sort of the standard workflow, has been true and tried. Of course, it doesn't make sense. What's the problem here? We, have a, a, we are poisoning our, our, our models, why? We look at the test data, and we do the model testing more than once. If you do it just once, and it's fine. This is like you take the data, you put it somewhere, and then you're going to test. But if you do this in a loop more than once, then basically it's going to mean that you're going to overfit your data. And that's something that is very difficult to avoid. And trust me, uh, many people, myself included, have, have done it over and over again. So overfitting is, is really the main problem of the standard workflow. However, there is no other workflow. Unless you have an infinite amount of data, which you never do, especially not in renewable energy, then uh, there is no, uh, no, 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 real way, no, no real way around it. Okay, um, I, I'll, I'll briefly want to mention about commercialization of AI. So at this day and age, um, it doesn't make sense to write your own algorithm. Uh, you can do it if you want to, to be fancy, you can do it if you want to have fun, but uh, uh, with the exception of leisure activities, uh, you should get almost all algorithms for free out there. The, they work, they're trained. You can get it in MATLAB, you can get it in, in Python, you can get it in R, you can get it in you know, many ways, more than you can imagine. Um, in AI, uh, as, as, a, as opposed to other fields, um, I mean, it's really about working. If it works, then, you know, then that's great. And if it doesn't, then, you know, the pudding is not good. That doesn't matter, that doesn't matter how fancy, uh, how, what, what fancy ingredients you put in it. And then I want to mention, uh, initially even, even in this uh, preliminary uh, uh, part, that there is a complexity parameter. And let's look at how, uh, what, what, is, what it means. So the comp complexity parameter is, is uh, uh, you can think of, you call it the capacity here. And here we have performance. And what we see here is that uh, there, are, there is a region where uh, you, you, your capacity is too small, so your, your model is too, too weak. For example, uh, I want to model something with a linear model of, uh, with just one tap. So just uh, assume that, say, tomorrow's wind just depends on today's wind in a linear fashion. That's too simple. That's going to lead to underfitting. And then there is the issue of when the capacity goes, uh, uh, bec becomes too large. That's going to uh, uh, lead to to overfitting. I can take many parameters, and I can ba basically fit my data, and overfit exactly the number that I have, and that's going to lead to overfitting. So it is a sort of a Goldilocks uh, kind of conundrum, right? You want to go to not too simple, but not too complicated. And this is known as the classical bias variance trade-off. So why? Bias here is how much you, you fit your data. As your capacity becomes larger and larger, you're, you become better and better. Uh, and you can eventually have uh, almost zero, zero, bi uh, zero bias. Variance means how, what kind of uh, uh, small perturbation in the data, how much they're going to lead to, uh, to a different model. 
the more parameters you have, the more opportunities you will have to overfit your data, and that's going to lead to high variance. And fi figuring out where this point is is something that is not always easy to do. We'll see a particular example when we talk about um, about uh, trees and, and uh, uh, how to do it, but but that's um, uh, trees and forest, how to do it. Okay, so this is the standard workflow. In the standard work workflow, we need to sort of figure out what the capacity parameter is. And uh, you know, it works well when you have uh, uh, good, very really good features. It calls for feature engineering, meaning you look at your data, you figure out what are the important features, you select them, you choose them, you prune them, uh, you modify them, you collect them, you pet them, you talk to them, you remember them, you love them. Once you have those features, uh, you use them, uh, uh, and, and it works for small data. But for big data, meaning, you know, big is a matter of uh, perspective, right? For big data, for me, is something that I cannot fit on my laptop. Um, um, so for big data, that's, uh, that becomes a, 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 big, uh, a big issue in terms of memory and, and, uh, and compute. And also there is this uh, quote that I, I really like, that, you know, remember that all models are wrong. But some are useful, and our job as machine learners is to find the useful ones. We'll never be able to model a, a very complex process. Think about anything that you're doing in your PhD. This is too complex to capture precisely, but we just want to make sure that uh, uh, our model is useful. So that's a standard workflow. Uh, what happened is that uh, um, in, the, in, in recent years is that there is a new workflow which is emerging, that the, 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 the neural network uh, or deep learning uh, uh, workflow. Basically, this is a, a deep learning uh, thing, I'm sure, uh, um, um, a neural network, I'm sure that you've seen it. There are weights, the weights are, are um, uh, take your inputs, your input is summarized, uh, is, is summed, and then go through uh, an activation function. This example is a sigmoid, but there are many others. And, and there are other units which we'll, we'll talk about uh, when we talk about uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, it goes through uh, uh, this whole um, um, network. There is an output layer, and that's about it. The whole issue is that we know how to, to uh, train those very efficiently. So the workflow with deep learning is kind of different now. Uh, so with deep learning, the assumption is that we have a lot of data, a lot of data with labels. This is the assumption that, that is usually made. And you'll see a fringe uh, a work saying maybe we can do without labels, or we can do with small data. All applications that I am aware of that work really well have a lot of, uh, a lot of data and, uh, and a lot of samples. And the idea is the following. You, you take a training set, and then you poison it uh, and completely. So you, do, uh, you overfit uh, the data. You validate. You overfit. Adjust hyperparameters. There are many hyperparameters in, in deep learning. That's why you need very big GPUs. Um, and then you train it for many, many times, and then eventually features are created um, because of this, uh, of this uh, training. And let's let understand what I mean by features. You take the input layer, and when you look at what is happening in the hidden layer, this is, a, this is potentially a very complex function. Let's say hidden layer number three. It can depend essentially on all the inputs. So the features are, can be very complicated, but those features are good enough uh, to, uh, uh, to make a, a good, uh, good decisions. And, um, and basically, you learn the features. So, so this, this alleviates the burden of you know, having your features, knowing them, petting them, and so forth. Okay. And, and just to, uh, to explain a theory, so the theory is that when you have small data, traditional machine learning works well, but it's hard for traditional machine learning to scale when the data becomes very large, uh, while deep learning keeps scaling. So this is a theory. Uh, lots of hot air around, around it, many searches, as, as you can see and we'll talk about it some more. Uh, this is just an example for vision. Uh, vision is a, an interesting problem, especially in, term, in, in the context of renewable energy, because it shares a lot with some weather-related uh, weather uh, uh, problems. Uh, so this is a sort of uh, um, just a probabilistic prediction. Some of it is, is, is great, like a person, 99%. Some of it is you know, not so great. Uh, there is a, um, a kite here and so forth. So, so deep nets can, can basically solve fairly well vision problems, much better than humans. So superhuman performance instead of state, state driving cars is being achieved by deep networks. Um, okay, so what about small data? So this is a bit of uh, folklore. Do you know who this is, anyone? So this is the original Mechanical Turk. Okay, so this was a, a, a robot in, I think in Europe in the 1880s, a robot. There was uh, a small man inside who was a pretty good chess player, 
and uh, he sort of moved uh, the pieces from below, and uh, he sat inside, and this was uh, uh, the, the original uh, um, machine learning um, hoax, so if you want, let's not use more harsher words. Um, so when you have small data, um, you really need a lot of very good labels, so you need manual labelers, and that's, by the way, what is done for division in AVs. And, and in many problems, especially in renewable energy, we do have small data. It's small because maybe things change and we don't have, we cannot rely on the past too much, or it's small just because there are that many days uh, in, in you know, that many years where, where we have data. Okay, so, so what can we solve? Uh, we can solve easy problems that have um, an easy solution, or we can have problems that have huge label data sets. And the important is labels. You need to have, uh, have labels. Um, and then um, I'm going to sort of give you some taste about uh, what happens uh, when you have two, two different types of problems that are of interest. Um, so how do you evaluate a classifier? So, so this is a we'll talk about a prediction error. This is the binary classification. Um, we have, um, um, we want to, um, the, let's say both positive, positive and negative, positive and negative. Uh, true positive means that you, you said it's positive, but it really was positive. Uh, false negative means that it actually was positive and, and you said it was negative, so you, you falsely uh, said that it's negative. Um, and false positive and, uh, and, and, and uh, true negative. So basically, you write when you're in the green, true positive and true negative, and you're wrong when in, you're in the, in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the white. Um, now, you would agree with me that for some problems, for example, if I want to predict uh, when a, a machinery is going to fail, when, my, when the wind is not going to blow, uh, um, then obviously there is, might be a big difference between false positive and, and uh, the errors are not the same. Like each of those errors have different, different ways. So accounting for them in the same way does not make sense. Um, so often what we do is we look at this uh, the ROC curve. Uh, um, the ROC curve is the curve that uh, basically we look at uh, uh, the, our classifier has, uh, um, has uh, two points which we know that uh, we can always achieve. Uh, zero, zero, this is a, a true positive versus a, a false positive. So what, uh, to achieve this point zero, zero, what do I need to do? Always say? Always say? Negative, right? If I always say negative, then nothing is positive, so I'm zero, zero. And similarly, if I want to achieve this point of 100, 100, what should I say? Positive, right? If I always say it's positive, there is nothing wrong. So. So obviously, to interpolate between uh, those two is trivial, right? I can I, I always randomly say with probability, say half true uh, positive with probability half negative, and I'm going to be here. So everything that is below the the x equal y curve does not make sense, right? This is so we need to be above. And then the question is, how do I rate different methods? So so we see here that method uh, um, one is obviously always below method two. So method one, there is no point in using, right? Uh, okay, so method, uh, so method two and method uh, uh, three also, I mean, they're dominant. So whoever is dominant, but what about method four versus me method three? Which method would you prefer? <laughs> exactly, it depends on the application. So, so if you know that you're very sensitive uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to false positives, then you know you really you're working here in this uh, and this is the regime that you're you're interested in. So the green it might be better for you, but if on the other hand you, you're not that sensitive and this is sort of you you aim for a rate of uh, false positive of ten, then probably the blue is is the right one for you. So what I'm trying to to, to tell you here in this slide is that it's really about understanding what you prefer, and your preference is not that obvious. It's not obvious that you prefer minimal error. Minimal error is probably going to get you somewhere here. Um, but uh, but you, it's not really about that. It's about what you need for your application. Okay. Then I want to mention some other thing which is also very common in, in, in uh, renewable energy, and that's imbalanced data. So often we have imbalanced data, and if you ask me what should I classify, blue or red, just by error, so the answer is blue. always blue, right? Because there's very few reds, so why would I care about, uh, about, uh, about the reds? Uh, but sometimes they do care about the reds. And, uh, and there are two ways to overcome, uh, two principal ways. One is called oversampling. So in oversampling, basically, I'm going to sample more from the reds. One is undersampling, I'm going to sample uh, 
uh, less from the uh, uh, from the blues. Both have their own issues. Uh, both approaches are, have their own issues, but that this is in principle uh, something you, you always need to be mindful about. So, how often do you expect to see uh, the, the classes in your uh, in your data? Okay. So, so to wrap things about supervised learning, so does it work? Yes, it does. And there are many algorithms. And whenever we show an algorithm later uh, today, we'll talk about the trade-off bet between the compute time, the memory uh, requirements, and the data that you need. Also, we're going to talk about what kind of prior knowledge you can inject. And that's often the most important aspect. So what do I know about the problem, and how I can, I can, I can turn my, my prior knowledge into better performance? Um, and, and you know this is going to ha uh, occur in at least at least in every unit today. Always your problem might be that you don't have enough data. So get more data and get good data. That's always uh, uh, something that you can tell your boss uh, why you're not performing why, why, your, why the system is not performing well. Okay, I'll briefly talk about uh, reinforced learning now. Um, Sorry, yeah. So uh, um, there are two answers for that. The first answer is the honest one, then not much I can help you with. Okay. Um, so and, and I'll explain why. If you look at, uh, say, renewable energy, look at the, the we, we discussed it uh, before, at the Uri storm in, uh, in, in Texas and uh, south, and, uh, south central the US, this is an event that hasn't happened before. Like nobody could have expected, or you know, presumably could have expected, that nuclear power plants are going to uh, are to break down. They're supposed to be, I'm not break down, but to, to have to to go offline. Uh, so I, it's really that I cannot help you if there is an, an, an event that never happened before. However, um, there is one thing that you can't do, and that's you can stress test your uh, system. So and we'll talk about emulation. Uh, later on, you can emulate situations, and especially if you look at uh, at larger grids, uh, then you can emulate wh what happens when things start uh, to break down, and you can ask yourself the re opposite question: of, so, how many things need to break down for you know for something that I really care about would would break down? And if this number is not satisfactory for you, then you need to rethink. <coughs> so, uh, reinforcement learning uh, that's a that, a different type of machine learning. Um, here we have an, an agent, we have the environment, the, envi the agent observes something about the environment, gets a reward, and, and does, does actions. Um, the model is very simple. Um, uh, and, and, and this is what, basically, it was kind of an obscure field. Uh, but then things started happening um, um, about five, maybe seven years ago. Um, and, and basically what happened is that this, you know, this agent here uh, started to use uh, deep learning. Um, the model itself, while, while simple, it still manages to win at Go chess, many robotics applications, and so forth. So, so the model is simple, but at least for a relatively closed environment, it works uh, 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 very well. Um, and um, and b basically, if you're a, a, a real electrical engineer, then this is control theory meeting machine learning. Okay, uh, just to sort of, there is a lot of, uh, of discussion about self-driving cars. Um, I'm not aware of anyone who's doing learning end-to-end -end at this point. So picture or images to, uh, um, to, to steering wheel and uh, brakes and, uh, and, 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 and gas, basically. So nobody's doing this today. Uh, and, and you know, this is a really complicated problem that you would expect to see uh, uh, a lot of uh, machine learning and indeed, uh, I think, Vision is, by, the, by, by and large, uh, in self-driving cars, uh, is, is done by, by machine learning. And much of the control is done, too. Okay, it depends on different companies have different. Uh, uh, and, and that's, by the way, uh, the reason I'm putting it here is that just, you, you know the scope of application. There are hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, engineers uh, working in you know, tens of companies all over the world trying to make this, uh, uh, make this work. Whether they succeed or not, I don't know, but uh, at least um, uh, what's known as level three uh, should happen uh, uh, quite soon. Beyond that, that's not for me to tell. Um, just about robots. So when I grew up, I wanted to build either you know, Megatron or Data. 
Uh, but you know, if you, this is what we know how to build today, and if you know this is Neo, it's a kind of a, a cute toy, or this uh, industrial robot. Uh, robots are not happening yet. They will, but uh, not happening yet. You cannot buy uh, a robot for, for your home to, uh, uh, to, make, uh, to do the, your dishes or uh, to make laundry. Uh, quite a few companies are working on, on that. Seems to be pretty, a pretty difficult task, mostly because of uh, the fact that every house is, uh, is different. And uh, just about uh, game, uh, Go, uh, Go, I think, was uh, one of the most important breakthroughs uh, of, uh, uh, of our area. Uh, um, this is, uh, um, I think, probably everybody heard about, about, uh, of AlphaGo, uh, beating uh, uh, the world uh, champion in Go. It's clear that uh, humans will never beat machines in, in any game. Bridge is the next one that is going to be solved, or at least uh, this is the, currently this is uh, the last bastion of human superiority. And I think uh, by the end of um, my projection is that by the end of 2023, this will also uh, be gone. Uh, just AlphaGo, you see, it's very important. They also have a Netflix uh, movie for them, so it's uh, they made a big splash, and and it's a really it's a big deal. Um, it was a big deal because it came as a surprise uh, for many, um, myself included. Um, and it's really about doing search very efficiently. And search is something that we, as control engineers, also need to be aware of. Uh, and, and I think uh, 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 in, the last, in the very last part of today's uh, uh, talk, I'll, I'll give you an example where search is really important for uh, uh, c considering uh, a grid. Okay. Uh, I, I want to mention uh, before we, we move to the next part that you know everything that we, we've done is that all products are trained in the safety of your lab. There are very few machine learning uh, um, uh, machine learning I would say systems that training is happening in the field. So everything is manicured, pedicured, and, and everything is, is very well managed. And, and once you move to the field and you think about you train something that is supposed to work and retrain uh, all the time, then it's a big question. It's what's known as ML ops, how to maintain uh, control and robustness of something that works in the field. So there is a big caveat to everything that we said today, and we'll say today. If you want to unleash training in the field, you need to know exactly what you're doing, and you need to have safeguards uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for that. OK, that's uh, something cute. I, I, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar. There are, are also vulnerabilities. So this is a classifier that here is a, a, the input. The output is you know, almost 99% uh, chance a banana. Great, right? Then you put, uh, you put uh, the sticker here. And now it, it becomes a toaster. Right. So, so there are vulnerabilities. And these vulnerabilities are going to be uh, exasperated for systems where, that are not visual. So this is a visual system. It's easy to understand what's going on here. For other systems that are less visual, that may be, uh, uh, may be uh, uh, a real problem. It can be a real uh, vulnerability, and there are many others. This is just a very uh, sort of one of the first examples. There are examples where you cannot really see the patch, the patches, you know, something. And there are also, um, also uh, over the air attacks, uh, which, are me which mean that basically um, I'll hand you a banana and I'll, I'll show it to, say, um, uh, to, to, to the image recognition system, and it will, it will think it's a toaster. OK, so just in terms of openness, so um, all the companies here and others uh, have their algorithms uh, um, sold or given mostly for free. Not just the algorithm, but also the, the, the architecture, the data plan. Everything is there. There are lots of data sets, uh, uh, both for, for NG and for other things. And I should mention, if you want to get experience, in, uh, you know, try Kaggle. Okay, Kaggle is a great place to start. You will find a lot of data there. A lot of uh, Everybody knows what Kaggle is. So Kaggle is, is, is Kaggle.com is a place where there are competitions. So let's suppose that uh, you have a data set which is interesting. Whatever data set. You could put it the, there, and either you give a monetary prize, not in a large amount, but still a monetary prize, to encourage people to, to participate. And there are different rules, different types of competition. There are hundreds of competitions going on. And you can alert, learn a lot by, by watching. There are also there are some renewable energy related competitions there. So you can learn a lot about, by, by watching uh, what is there and also by, um, uh, by participating. Um, OK, um, here is the elephant in the room. 
Um, once you build a machine learning system, everything becomes very complicated. Uh, just think about the systems that we, I mentioned here, but there are many others. And you need to have a verification plan. That's, you know, good engineers have verification plans. And the problem is that, that almost all the systems that are mentioned here uh, have some feedback loop, which is internal. So you need to verify something that will change. And as a result of your actions, which, of course, uh, you need to still be able to, uh, uh, to figure out what different agents will do, what uh, the different systems will do. So you need to know when your system is failing. And that's uh, sort of the, the most important aspect uh, of, uh, of machine learning for our renewable energy. You need to know when you're, you're not going to work. OK. So, so to conclude uh, this first overview part, um, um, this is a new era uh, for machine learning. Uh, basically, the, 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 the effort to, to, to use machine learning has become negligible. You need the connection to the internet, Python, and that's it. If you have that, that's all that you need. You need to think about your compute efforts versus your data, how much data you have, how much compute you're willing to, to spend. There are lots of algorithms there. We'll, today, we're going to, to, to discuss a very small number of algorithms, which to me are basic. But there are lots of algorithms out there. You don't need to find the, the fanciest one. Just find the one that works for you. And then methodology is the key. Uh, overfitting is easy. There are many other pitfalls that you can, uh, you can, you can uh, uh, gladly walk into and not know it until you uh, deploy. And then once you deploy, you need to have uh, safeguards. So I think that uh, uh, we'll move now to the, next, uh, to the next part, and then we'll take a coffee break. Uh, Spires, can you move to part two? All right, so um, we'll move to talking about algorithms. <coughs> and what we're going to do, to do now is we're going to talk about the three uh, most basic algorithms. If you're not using uh, these algorithms for any problem that somebody gives you, you're doing something wrong. So you have to use those algorithms first, and only then look for something fancier. We'll talk about decision trees. Uh, those are the basic algorithms used in explainable AI. They're very simple, not very good, but very simple. Well, then we'll talk about nearest neighbor. That's an algorithm that, for a particular type of prior knowledge, works very well. Also, it comes with some, some theoretical guarantees. And then, while well, being engineers, we have to talk about linear models. Linear models are going to be the basis for essentially everything that we do. OK. So just uh, in terms of uh, our, 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 the process, we, we call that inductive learning. So we take uh, training data with labels. Uh, then we have a learning algorithm. The learning algorithm is, go is going to output a model. Uh, this model is going to uh, uh, take a test uh, example, output a label, and that's about, uh, about it. Our objective is to generalize. So you want to be able to perform, to take the training data and then perform well on the test, hoping that the test and the data that we'll eventually get are going to be uh, of the same uh, uh, nature. So we'll talk, going to, we're going to talk about regression and classification today, uh, not so much about uh, ranking. Ranking means that you have uh, uh, several items, and you, you rank them from the best to the worst. Think about when you're browsing Amazon, for example, and then you get, uh, and if, you, you, if you, put, uh, you put in a query, then you get uh, uh, several, several items ordered according to, uh, the, hopefully, the chance that you're going to pursue them. Okay, so this is uh, taken from scikit-learn. Um, so, um, Anyone here have used Scikit-Learn? OK, a good number. Uh, so Scikit-Learn, and this is just a, ch a cheat sheet. Basically, you start, you look at how many samples you have. If, if, if you don't, if you have really, really nothing, then you need more data. Um, if they ask if your data is categorical, so if it's, um, you know, if it's labeled as, uh, if your, uh, your features are, are not numerical, um, then, if, it's, uh, then if, it's, if no, then you, you quantify it and so forth. So this is uh, uh, the cheat sheet, and the cheat sheet we have, uh, um, see this is uh, two unsupervised learning algorithms, clustering, um, clusters, uh, clustering and dimensionality reduction, regression, and classification. 
So we're not going to, of course, touch uh, all of them, but uh, we're going to focus on classification today and a little bit on regression uh, as well. And then we'll, we'll move on uh, when you talk about uh, uh, later on to the other approaches. Okay, so decision tree. This is a very simple algorithm. This is known as, as decision stumps. Uh, so here I have, uh, um, I have uh, I start, and then I ask, this is uh, the tree is going to look like. If it, x1 is less than, than a threshold, then I move to this part of the tree. If it's not, then this part of the tree, and so <coughs> forth and so forth. And then on the leaves, I have the labels. In this case, five labels. It's a very simple uh, decision tree. And the question is, how do I learn this decision tree? I mean, uh, do note that this is fully explainable, right? If I need to, if you, I ask you, like, why did you think that this sample uh, was, uh, uh, was R4, then you can say, well, you know, it's uh, X1 was something. And then uh, because it was, say, less than T1, then I, uh, uh, the, it was more than T1, then uh, I decided to go here. And, you know, I can, I can give you an explanation that is reasonable. And then you can, you can judge whether my, expl my, my explanation is good or bad. But I can give you a reasonable explanation. Um, this is an example for fruits. It's a very famous example. I look at the, the color. If it's green and it's big, then it's going to be a watermelon. If it's, uh, say, yellow and it's, uh, uh, then it's and it's thin, it's going to be a banana and so forth. So here you get a really nice explanation, right? It's, it's, it's a solid, logical explanation. Okay. And for classification, uh, there are different approaches how to decide which node to divide. So you start from the root, then you divide, you have some nodes, and then uh, you're going to sort of ask your question, well, this is a leaf node. Uh, I can see what kind of data I get here. Should I give it a label and terminate? Or maybe I should split it according to some feature and, and, and move on. Um, and uh, that's, uh, um, the question is uh, um, which node to divide and, and, and what divisions uh, uh, should be. Um, and you can also do it for regression. In regression, often it's either that you have here at the leaves, uh, you have a, a random variable, or that or that you have here a linear uh, regressor itself, or that you just have a, a, a fixed number. So you can even do it for trees. It's, uh, it's very easy. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to divide, because there are algorithms out there. One of them is, I mean, we'll give the names later, but there are algorithms that know how to do this very well. Um, but here is a phenomenon which is interesting. So, so this is uh, um, um, how overfitting look, uh, would look like. You look at the size of the tree, and, and basically you, you start to increase it. And you ask what happens on the training data. So as you increase, on the training data, we expect performance to always improve, right? Because I split only when it makes sense. Um, but on the test data, well, it is starts increasing. And then at some point, it starts decreasing. Because I do things I'm not supposed to be doing. I'm just, well, guessing things randomly. So uh, the, when you, often what you do is you, you divide your data to test, train, and validate. So, uh, and, and on the validation data, once you start seeing that there is a drop, um, the, the, the validate is not, cannot be used for train. It just val it's go just going to validate the, the, parameter, the parameter, the complexity parameter. In this case, the size of the tree or the number of, uh, of, uh, of nodes in the tree. And then you, you realize that, well, here things start dropping, so maybe I'm going to limit the complexity of the tree. So this is an example for limiting the complexity of a machine learning object. In this case, a very simple tree that buys you good or oh, better generalization. Also note that always, the, the, uh, the, the train, or almost always, uh, the training is, uh, looks better than, uh, than the testing. And that's one of the bad things about machine learning. You're almost always overly optimistic, right? You always think that your performance is going to be better uh, than, uh, than it is. OK. So, so uh, to summarize trees, uh, trees are interpretable. That's great. They're compact. Keeping them is almost trivial. They also work with categorical data. So if you decide, for example, let's suppose that uh, I want to, to, to say that um, the risk level is high or low. How do I ba base the risk level? I don't know. There maybe there are several parameters that they use. So they work with uh, uh, categorical data very well. And, but they can also easily overfit data. Now, with the exception of uh, machine learning courses, you don't need to build trees yourself. There, are, uh, there, there is something called ID3, uh, C5.0. CART, C-A-R-T, um, that know how to do it very well. They, they have all sort of heuristic, uh, heuristic um, um, mechanisms to, uh, uh, to decide which, tr which uh, uh, tree to, um, which uh, node to, to, uh, to divide and when to stop. So, so you don't have to do it yourself. 
You can download them. I think they're all for free. There are many others uh, 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 as well. And, and basically, this is when somebody gives you data with labels. This is sort of the first algorithm that you try. You try to put it in the decision tree. If it works, that's it. Time to go home, get some rest. If not, then only you should move uh, forward. I would like to mention something about the, 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 um, uh, the compute memory prior knowledge uh, uh, conundrum here. So the compute that you need to build a tree is usually negligible. Okay, all those algorithms are very, run very, pretty quickly. Like they would run on your cell phone even if you have a Nokia, an old Nokia. Um, the memory, you need to store all your data, which is fine, but that's about it. The tree itself is usually not going to be very large. So memory is great. What about prior knowledge? So prior knowledge means that you have good features. Where do you have good features? I don't know, that's your problem. In any given, given instance, you need to figure out if you have good features or not. And if you don't, then this is not going to work out for you. So if your features are great, this is a great algorithm to use. And if your features are not good, then it's not. Okay, so uh, you need to sort of judge uh, to, your, uh, to yourself whether or not you have good features. So we talked about trees. They are the first fundamental algorithm. Now I'm going to talk about, uh, about K and N. That's the second fundamental algorithm. So, so K and N, that's uh, an ancient algorithm. I, I don't really even know when, when it's uh, from, probably before I was born. Um, and and, and that, that, the idea of the algorithm is very simple. There, you have uh, your data, uh, in this case reds and uh, blues. I give you a new point, and this point you, 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 look, you count its neighbor. In this case, K equals nine. So you look at its nine neighbors, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You count how many are reds, how many are blue. If there are more reds than blue, you call it red. If there are more blues than red, you call it blue. Very simple, you look at the, at the, nearest, at the K nearest neighbors and do a majority vote between them. Simple enough, right? It can, it can be weighted majority, it can be uh, different types, but, but it's a very simple algorithm. Okay, let's understand the effect of K. So when k equals 1, in this example, you see that this is a very funky looking um, a curve. And there, it, uh, there are holes in, uh, in here. It almost looks like the map of, uh, of uh, Denmark. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so k equals 1 means that the complexity is of, that you allow is very high. Okay? Because you can get very strange curves. When k equals 5, it looks a little bit more balanced, but still it's not quite, quite balanced. When k equals 30, it's much more balanced, it's almost uh, piecewise uh, uh, linear. And when k equals 50, well, then, then it's, uh, uh, basically, um, uh, it's basically almost linear. Now, I have a question to you. What would happen, let's suppose that there are 150 samples here, if k equals 150? No split. So it will either be red or blue, according to whether there are more than red points or blue points. So as we increase k, we get something that is simpler. So k is a, simpl is a simplicity uh, um, um, parameter here. So which k to choose, I have no idea. But this is an example for a meta-parameter or a hyper-parameter of an algorithm that we see. How many neighbors? And this is a sort of the first example of a meta-parameter. Meta okay. So this is a geometric algorithm. And for this to work well, you need a metric. Now, where do you get a metric? Again, I don't know. This is your problem. For every, for every, every given uh, uh, instance, you need to find a, uh, to find a metric. There, and and there, are, there is a whole um, line of works in machine learning called metric learning that deals exactly with this problem, how to define a metric. You need to remember all data. That's a big, big memory problem. If you have a lot of data in high dimensions, then uh, uh, you need to figure out what to do. I should mention that uh, this is, of course, a simplification. Uh, you can reduce uh, the, the number of uh, points with using hash and so forth. Okay, now there is one theory. I, I, I mean, I, I asked uh, Jalal whether or not I should uh, present theory. So he said, don't put too much theory, but this is something that I have, to, I have to put. This turns out to be an optimal algorithm. Okay. So if your k grows with n, this is an algorithm that cannot be beat in some minimax sense that I can tell you uh, uh, over, over lunch. But, but this is a really good algorithm from a theoretical perspective. 
Uh, so even in spite of its simplicity, it's a, it's a great algorithm. I should mention that dimensionality kills this algorithm as well. So if, if the, the, the points are in very high dimension, then there is not much you can do because you get a lot of noise from the high dimensions. Uh, so usually what people are doing, they first they reduce dimensionality and then they do KNN. So in here, there, when you think about the compute memory prior knowledge, so the compute is, very, is, is quite good. You can, you can get, uh, if you have n points, then to find the closest k, k points, you need k n log n uh, compute time. So compute is great, memory is terrible, and prior knowledge is the metric. <coughs> so if you have a good metric, this is a good algorithm for you. And if not, then not. Okay. So let's talk, let's talk about linear models. So this is something that I, I'm, I'm sure that you are, 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 as engineers have seen many times. Uh, so I'm going to give you my own interpretation of linear models. Uh, so I, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything new, just that uh, this is how uh, machine learning learners uh, uh, view uh, linear models. So this is a linear model, it's protein, fat, uh, residuals. Um, um, residual is a difference from the linear, uh, linear part. Okay. So, so I'm going, we, the way we view things is that uh, we view that uh, uh, we view the classification problem of finding a, the best linear model as an optimization problem. So we have the data uh, x and y. Think about um, x can be uh, in any dimension that you like. Y is uh, say in, uh, in I mean, let's let's think about regression, uh, but doesn't have to be can be classification. And then we, you, what you really want to solve, you want to, 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 to minimize over, um, over the linear parts, so that's a W. Uh, this is known as the, the empirical loss. So this is one if uh, Y time, y, y, if, uh, if the, let's, let's think that Y here is plus minus one. So there are two labels, either it's plus or minus. Um, and what we have here is uh, uh, W dot XN, that's the inner product between W and X, uh, plus B. So if, it's, if, this, is, uh, if this is positive, then, uh, then, then both are, are, are positive or both are negative, mm -hmm. and you get one. So this is the problem that you really want to solve. This is the minimum error classifier. Unfortunately, unless the problem is what's known as separable, so unless you can actually uh, uh, separate your whole data to pluses, plus and minus, then this is NP-hard. Um, and uh, it's NP-hard in the dimension, not in the number of points. So the complexity is n, n to the power of d. And, uh, and also, it tends to favor Ws that are, are very large. Okay, so this is uh, so how, how we, we view the problem. So we have an NP-hard problem that, uh, that uh, prefers the large Ws, which uh, uh, means that they're going, well, going to be more complex Ws. So the several approaches, well, to solve, the, to, to make sure that we don't have this uh, uh, explosion in W, we can regularize. So we can add here, this is a, a lambda times a regularizer. Uh, the regularizer means that uh, when W is small, then this is going to be small. When W is large, this is going to be large. And, and that's a, it looks like a good idea, but then what are we doing here? We're, we're, we're adding apples and oranges. Why? Because this is, a, this is a count of errors, and this is a regularizer. So this is a norm or something. So we, there is no reason that they will, they will use the same currency. Okay, so, uh, so to, to make things uh, uh, concrete, it's almost always that people are looking at, at convex uh, loss uh, surrogate. So, so this is uh, the, 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 the zero one loss, that's uh, the one here. This is obviously non-convex. So there are different types of losses and they're written here, uh, uh, zero one, hinge, logistic, exponential, and squared, and, and they all bound this loss from above. So for example, if you look at the, at the hinge loss, that's, uh, I think, the, the, uh, the red one, so it's, uh, it's linear up to, um, up to one, and then it's uh, zero. So there are different, different ways to bound a con in, in convexly um, the zero one loss, which is not, uh, not convex. So, so now, uh, basically, we start from a problem that we know that is NP-hard, and now the problem that we have is that we have a sum over, over the, the point of a loss function, which is convex in W and, uh, and B plus a regularizer, which we can assume to be convex. So we have a convex optimization problem, and therefore, uh, assuming that W is not in super high dimensions, um, it's not a difficult problem. You can do stochastic grand descent, grad descent, uh, um, second order method, whatever you prefer. And often the regularizer is a norm, just because um, uh, their, uh, all norms are, uh, all p norms for p bigger than, bigger than one are convex, bigger than equal, 
and uh, usually they're solved very efficiently with, uh, with uh, a granite method. <coughs> okay. And, and I just want to mention something which is, I think, really nice, and that's uh, maximizing the margin. So, so let's suppose that I have here uh, uh, the, this problem. So it's a separable problem, but there are many, many Ws that can solve it, right? Um, I can solve it with this uh, classifier, but I can also have something that looks, looks like this, right? Or like this. Like which, which would I prefer? So, so the max margin gives you a, a principled approach. It tells you, um, it tells you basically, look at the, let's call that the margin. That's the distance of uh, of uh, the blue, uh, the distance of from the from the separating hyperplane uh, of the uh, of, of each uh, each point. And let's try to maximize it. So this is it turns out that this is also the most robust solution. So if you take the points and you'll perturb them. Like you'll, you'll perturb them, then this is going to be the, uh, will allow you the, the maximal perturbation. So, so at least from engineers, we're happy because we see robustness uh, kicking in. So, so you can do some, uh, uh, some math, and then you can say, well, you know, maybe the problem is not separable, so, so let's add some slack variables here. So let's add some, some slack. Uh, let's allow for a little bit more error. Um, and it turns out that this is a, a, a quadratic optimization problem. Okay. And this is known as, uh, as support vector machines. I'm not going to get into it, but, but basically uh, this is a quadratic optimization problem. You, are, you, uh, you, you want to minimize the weights, uh, B and uh, the, the slacks. Uh, the slacks are linear, uh, and the, the weights are quad quadratic. And this is a very simple quadratic constraint, quadratic optimization problem that you can solve super efficiently uh, as well. There are, in fact, there are algorithms that don't even require you to compute the gradient. So you, you can do it even without gradient, but with some other iterative algorithm. And that turns out to be the same, um, like, uh, like solving uh, um, this uh, large margin. This is sort of the complexity parameter. You want the complexity to be small. And this is uh, um, the slack. So this is the hinge loss. Remind you, this is the hinge loss, the, 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 the red one. And you want, the, uh, you want that to be. Um, like, can you explain why is it greater equal than 1? Because in the previous slide, you had greater equal than 0. Yeah, so you need the you need the slacks, right? So so here you, the, those slacks allow you to 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 have uh, errors because you can you you you're saying well maybe I'm willing to have uh, to have uh, to have errors uh, to make something simpler. Okay, so at this point you would say well you know who cares about linear classification, right? Uh, linear models are simple, but but it turns out that everything that we did so far works even if you have uh, you take your data and you have it. You, you run it through some fixed nonlinear function. And this goes back to what we discussed about features. If you have good features, meaning that you have a good function f, you have some insight into the problem from your design, then basically everything that we said works. So far, you, you just need to apply it uh, uh, efficiently. Also, if there is a way to, to use that, to make things uh, uh, nonlinear using what's known as the kernel trick, not going to get into that today. Um, very interesting trick. Basically, it turns uh, your input space uh, through some uh, uh, mapping to, um, to higher dimensional feature space. You work in the feature space, but do all the computation in the input space. And, and, that's, uh, and that's about it. OK. So just uh, uh, linear models. So those, are very, those models are very simple. This is one way to think about it. You get input data. You, mo you, mo you move them through, uh, uh, you multiply them uh, by through weights. Your output prediction is, is, uh, is a linear sum. In terms of compute memory, uh, prior knowledge, compute, trivial, right? I mean, I do SGG, unless the dimensionality and the number of the points is, is, is extreme, I can solve it very easily. Memory, trivial. All that I need is to have a very few sample. Prior knowledge, I need my features to be good. So this is really what everything boils down to. If my features are not good, then this is not uh, the way to go. Okay, uh, I think now would be a good time to take a, uh, to take a break. <laughs> All right, so uh, I will continue with uh, the third part. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is going to talk about models. So we started with the basis, basic foundational algorithms, and, and we're going to talk about about modeling of data. And uh, I'm going to talk about probabilistic models to start with. Uh, then I'm going to talk about neural networks. Of, uh, and and you know, there is a reason why there it's, it's under, under models. Uh, 
and you'll see that shortly, and then I'm going to talk about the ensemble methods. So after you've exhausted uh, the first three approaches and they don't work for you, then you need to start thinking about what really is it that you're trying to solve, and that's the reason of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this part. So the first model that we're going to discuss is, is probabilistic models. Um, the idea here is that uh, you want to model the data, our x and y, as a, as a PDF, the probabilistic uh, distribution function d. And, and, and once you, this is whole, uh, again, this, this can be a whole course uh, on its own, um, even uh, perhaps a, a, a whole degree. Uh, but, but there are really two flavors. There is the conditional, so I, I, I generate y, and then given y, I'm going to generate x, and there is uh, also the generative model. So I'm going to want to generate both x and y uh, simultaneously. Um, and then, what, but if I have this, uh, this PDFD, then and finding the, the, uh, the, the label is usually easy. That's, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do a base optimal uh, classifier, so you can basically maximize over the space of labels, whether uh, classification or regression, and you can, you can do that uh, easily. So if you have D, you're the king. Okay. You know exactly what to do, but the question is, where do you get D from? Like, where do you have the, the joint distribution of the data from? And, uh, and let's talk about estimation of D. So um, you can do a model-based uh, uh, maximum likelihood, so you can, you can assume that you know the model for D, Gaussian, mixture of Gaussian, Poisson, whatever uh, you know, that's going to be your inductive bias, knowing the model, or presuming that you know the model, and then you can do maximum likelihood. Okay, so unless you have a very easy problem or very strict assumptions, this becomes very hard very quickly. So unless you assume, say, that x is, you know, x is Gaussian or x comma y is Gaussian, then the problem becomes very hard very quickly. Um, uh, so just to give you an example, let's suppose that we have a very simple binary decision problem. Your, your y is, uh, uh, zero, say, either 0 or 1, and x given y is uh, a normal uh, random variable with, um, with, matri with uh, um, uh, in D and D dimensions. Then, unless d is really small, this becomes a very hard problem because you need uh, all, all of these square parameters to estimate. So, so this is not, this would work for d equals you know, 20. It will not work for d equals 300. There are just going to be too many parameters. So the common solution uh, is to make what's known as the naive Bayes assumption. Basically, this assumption means that, uh, um, that you, you assume that the coordinates are independent. It's a very bad assumption, but it works. Okay, so sometimes it works. And if you make this assumption, then basically instead of, uh, of, being, of needing all of these square parameters, you only need all of D parameters. Because basically you assume that the, the, the matrix, the covariance matrix of the Gaussian is a diagonal matrix. And that basically solves your problem. So, so uh, I mean, this is how you would estimate D. And there are many ways to estimate D. And this is not what I want to focus on. Um, I want to focus on, on generative models here. So suppose that um, I have an estimate D. And then I have another estimate. Um, uh, I have an estimate of D, which I call D prime. Can I trust this estimate? Is this a good estimate or not? Do I have enough data? So, so this is, seems like a question I cannot solve, right? Because maybe I can, maybe I can. So the answer is yes, sometimes you can. You can answer it in the negative, not in the positive. So you can say, I do not have enough data. You cannot say I have enough data. Um, so how do you do that? You do what's known as emulation. So what, is it, what does it mean to emulate? Let's suppose that I have uh, endpoints. From endpoints, I, I estimate a D prime. So I say, well, I think that my data is distributed and going to D prime. Now I have D prime. I can estimate another endpoint from D prime. I can emulate, I can generate them. And then I can estimate within the same procedure D prime prime. Now, if my method is internally correct, D prime and D prime prime should be essentially the same, if N is large enough. So let this uh, uh, sink in. Um, if D prime is not close to D prime, then it means that my process is not self-consistent. Therefore, I need more data or to choose uh, some, other, some other D. It's important to understand, my, 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 for any given number of data points, for N, I need to know what complexity of D I can uh, try to estimate. 
You can always try to, uh, you can always estimate something which is overly complex. For example, I can ask, let's suppose that I have a, a sum of Dirac measures or, or some other very complicated uh, uh, PDF. If I'll generate from this PDF uh, more points, it will not end well. Like I will see that I cannot re-estimate what I had before. So emulation is the key here. And emulation is going to be the key throughout the rest of this lecture. If you cannot emulate the process that generated your data, then something is wrong. Okay, and, and, and the reason is that um, basically it's very easy to try and use very fancy models to estimate D. Uh, but there is no guarantee that those models are good. Uh, and, and this is one way to, es to evaluate whether your process is, is working properly. So this can answer a question like, how much data do you need? And uh, do I have enough data? The answer is always going to be in the, when you give an answer in the negative. The fact that you manage to, uh, to evaluate uh, D prime prime uh, to be close to D prime does not mean that your, your, your overall process is, is good. It just means that you're self-consistent. For example, if your D prime is going to be, say, always you choose a Gaussian with uh, zero mean and, and unit, uh, uh, unit variance, you don't look at the data. In that case, D prime and D prime prime are going to be the same. Of course, this is meaningless because you don't look at data. So, so what I'm trying to, to, to advocate for is heavy usage of emulation. You get the data, you build a generative model from the data, mm -hmm. you generate fake data from your generative model, mm -hmm. and then you see whether this fake data and your real data look the same. Okay, this is really what emulation is about. And for power engineers in particular, where the models are, are complicated, that's something that you need to, uh, uh, to consider. Okay, uh, let's look at one particular con conditional model. That's, uh, the model here is uh, uh, conditional, so uh, the data from X and Y, is, you, can, you, can you, can, uh, uh, make it, you can write it as D of Y times P of X given Y. And then, uh, for example, you, 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 you can compute uh, um, the, the label to be, uh, for every uh, xn, uh, the label to be a, a sigmoid. This, is, uh, this function is, is known as a sigmoid uh, of uh, w dot x uh, uh, plus uh, uh, bias. Uh, you compute um, uh, the, 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 the zn and um, the, la the label as a Bernoulli Reimer variable with uh, this mean. So in extreme value, it's going to be deterministic and then uh, when things are around zero, it's going to be uh, uh, roughly half, and then you return uh, 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 yn to be plus minus one. So this is a generative model, right? If you need to have here w and b, and that's it. If I have w and b, I can generate data. If you like this model, this is really what's known as logistic regression, okay? So logistic regression, which I think many of you know, and this is also what you get from linear model and logistic loss, it can be reinterpreted in this way. Okay, so we build a generative model based on the assumption that our data look, uh, would look like this. So there is a sampling process, and the sampling process is really all that you need. So I want this to sink in. This is a very popular model, right? This is sort of, if I had to write four models as, as the foundational models, this would be the fourth one. Logistic regression, the basis, basis for neural network, that's exactly a generative model with uh, conditional under these assumptions here. <coughs> okay. All right, let's move to neural networks. So, um, the neural networks, the classical model, you have, we have an input la uh, layer. Uh, usually what's here is numerical values. If you have categorical values and you need to convert them to numerical values, many ways to do it. Uh, most popular one is what's known as one hot vector. If I have, for example, male or female, then I'll give zero to male, one for female. That's a, a, a one hot vector. If I have seven categories, then I can have either a seven dimensional uh, a binary uh, vector. So zero, 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 and then say the fourth uh, category, I'm one and then zero. So and there are many other ways to do it, but the input layer has to be uh, in principle all numerical. Then here I have uh, uh, um, um, different layers, and these layers are going to uh, compound uh, um, some function, and this function is going to, uh, to output uh, y1 and y2. Uh, could be multiple labels, could be single label, uh, many things that you can do here. 
Um, this is an example for convnets. Convnets are useful uh, not, just, uh, uh, not just for vision, but also for, for weather prediction. Here, the input is um, uh, 28 times 28, uh, in this case, uh, time, time one. So this is a binary, uh, binary image. Here, the, the, uh, sorry, a black and white uh, image. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, if, if it would be uh, something else, uh, uh, some, let's say uh, RGB, then you have three here. So your input is, uh, is um, the layer, and then you have uh, um, uh, con uh, convolution. So convolution takes, uh, say, four, uh, uh, in this case, five, five by five kernel, <coughs> and then it, it, it goes to, um, uh, to some, some channels. Uh, the channels are, are, can be different convolutions. And then you can have a max pooling, a max would take the maximum value. Um, and then you, have, uh, you can have another convolution, another max. Uh, you can have different types of nonlinear activation functions. And uh, uh, the layers can be uh, fully connected, um, like here. This is a, uh, usually the last layer is, uh, is fully connected because uh, it gives you max, max uh, flexibility uh, for the outputs. And here what you have is you have a numerical output, so 0, 1, 2, and uh, 2, 9, meaning the probability that the, this image is, in this case, 2, or probability it's 1, or, or 9, and so forth, and then you will renormalize. So this is uh, during inference time. And, but when you think about it, uh, a feed-forward network is really uh, taking Y to be um, um, this um, layer, uh, compound over this layer, compound over this layer, compound, compound it all the way. So it's a really very complicated compounding of different uh, functionals. And if these functions are, are differentiable, you can simply use a chain law, right? The chain law in, from, from calculus means that you can take the derivatives, uh, the, the derivative of, uh, of, this, uh, of this function and just do it uh, precisely. Now, convolutions are linear functions. Uh, pooling is also can be approximated by linear functions. Other activation functions are other sigmoid, which is a, a very nice differentiable function, but other activation functions can also be easily uh, uh, derived. So basically, when you, we, we say that we do back propagation, what we mean is that we use a chain law or the chain rule, and we do it from the output according to the loss calculation. Usually, we'll, we'll, ha we'll try to have a, 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 a differentiable loss. Doesn't have to be convex, by the way. It can be pretty, uh, whatever you want, logistic loss, L2 loss, whatever uh, uh, you wish. So when, you, when we learn, we back propagate. When we in do inference, we forward pro propagate. So we take the input and push it into the, into, into the network. So, so basically, um, at this point, this is all there is. I mean, the, the chain, rule, chain rule is uh, the, the essential part here of the map. It can get quite complex. Uh, technically, but you shouldn't consider yourself with that because it's already implemented. So the way to do it efficiently can be get, uh, get a bit complicated. You need to, to remember a lot of things. So the network can become very wide. So the layers can be very, very large. They can become very deep. So I have seen uh, networks of, uh, of with uh, a thousand layers. So it can be very deep, can be very wide, but that's not your problem. As long as you can fit them into your GPU between 40 gigabyte, uh, then you're all set. If you need more, then there are ways to, to deal with more. But, but basically, training is done by gradient descent. Okay. This is just an example for uh, a, a fairly classical network called uh, VGG16. Uh, it takes as an image um, 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 a, a color 224 times 224 uh, image. Uh, it goes uh, 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 through uh, continents. There are um, there are uh, two layers of, uh, of uh, convolutional plasma uh, trimming, so that's a ReLU part. Uh, there is max pooling that, uh, that uh, brings things to, uh, to a bit smaller, so it's a two by two um, uh, max pooling, and then there are more convnets and so forth, and that goes all the way to fully connected, which has a less layer, and eventually, uh, eventually soft max. Um, so this is an example for engineering a network. Now, what you see here, there are many things that appear arbitrary. Now, I can't explain why you would need here a 14 by 14 by 512. I, I have no idea. And I'm not sure that uh, whoever developed uh, VGG also has an idea. So there are many parameters here in the network. And those parameters are maybe arbitrary. Maybe it's important. I don't know. Uh, so one thing to, to bear in mind is that 
once you get to such a network that seems to work well, then you know, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. So you probably would like to, to stick with it. You like it, it works. So, so, um, so there is a whole search part, which is how to search for the parameters of a network. And that's something that is known as part of AutoML. Um, I'm again, not going to get into it if you want to read more. And that's how to search hyperparameters of your architecture and of your model. And just bear in mind, training VGG used to be considered expensive. Today, it's not so much expensive, but you will see that training can take a lot of time, a lot of, CP of GPU and CPU power, a lot of energy even. So when you take all that into account, one has to think that, you know, trying to starting to blindly search, that can be a real, a real issue. I mean, it can uh, start affecting your electricity bill. And, um, and basically, this is what uh, you need to be, uh, to be aware of that. Uh, so networks are, are something that uh, uh, are a bit difficult to train. Okay, there is one trick which I want to, uh, to mention, and that's, uh, I think it's a really, really uh, interesting trick called dropout. So when you train a network, this is a network that is a, a standard one. And in your training process, one thing that you can do is you can sort of X occasionally some neur uh, neurons or some elements. So basically you do the training, and then randomly you take a few, a few uh, elements and you just say, well, this is one, I'm, 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 it's not, I'm not going to modify it. And you can do it for uh, nodes, and you can do it for edges, and you can do it for both. And that's going to uh, allow you more to become more resilient. And the reason that this is, uh, this is so is that uh, it basically you, what, what you want to avoid is you want to avoid complete memorization of all your data. You, and, and neural networks that are large have enough capacity to do so. They can, they can in, in, in fact, memorize everything. Uh, so once you do that, you do not allow them to, uh, uh, to memorize everything, and, and th th that's going to make them uh, more resilient. Um, uh, there is a, uh, an animal called recurrent neural network. Uh, basically, there is an, a, an arrow that goes into it. Um, I'm not going to, uh, maybe, maybe some of you have heard of uh, LSTM, long short time memory uh, nodes. Um, basically, it's a, it's a structure where uh, there is a, instead of a feed forward that everything uh, during inference goes from uh, input to output and during uh, training from output back to input in backprop, uh, you need to have uh, um, errors inside. Again, the principle still works. It's, it's still everything that uh, uh, the training still works, it's just harder to train. Uh, if you've heard of BERT or uh, other transformer uh, methods, they all use uh, uh, some sort of, of recurrence. Um, in principle, it's the same, it's just the more difficult uh, to work with. Okay. Because we're talking about models, I want to mention uh, uh, something about embeddings. So this is a, a, um, an embedding of the text I like writing. It goes through an encoder, so um, input, sequ uh, input sequence to embedding. There is here something called embedding. And then there is a, a decoder um, that, uh, uh, in this case, it, uh, it uh, translates to French, uh, j'aime écrire. Um, so, so this is a um, sort of a translation uh, model. And the reason that it's, it's interesting is that, in principle, if I have this embedding, and this embedding works, I can use it from other languages as well, right? I can use it from, say, German, or from, from uh, 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 or, or maybe even from Hebrew. So I can take these embeddings, and I can, this is really the essential information. There is a redundancy in this language. I like writing. It's not a, I mean, there is a lot of redundancy. Maybe this embedding is really what I care about. This is really the information. And let's take it to something a little bit more uh, uh, engineered. So what, uh, what, I do, I, uh, what do people often do is they look at uh, they call it the latent variables and look at the information bottleneck. So I have an input layer and a reconstructed input layer. In principle, those are the same, or I want them to be the same. Then I, have the, uh, I take the, the input, I do some partial uh, destroying, I get another input, um, maybe I do some, uh, uh, some, add some noise, I use encoding, and then decoding. And this Z variable, that's the information bottleneck. I want this embedding to be such that all the relevant information is in the bottleneck. If I know how to do it, and if this bottleneck is low dimensional, then I should be able to generate bottlenecks. And then I can generate data. 
and then have a generative model that is built by the neural network. Now, surprisingly, this works. And this works actually much better than you would expect. So this works, works well. And this is how I can generate it. From a, so I have data. I have an encoder. This encoder, before I, I, I know that this encoder is, is a random variable, uh, Z, I can generate the, uh, samples of Z, and then I can generate fake data. This fake data, if I did my process properly, should have the same properties of the input data. And in fact, that's what happens when you look at uh, things like uh, uh, DALL-E 2. I'm sure that you heard all the buzz about, about it. If not, I'll, I'll tell you over lunch. Um, you can generate models that are, are super efficient, uh, that generate data. And, and this is very important for emulation. And remember, I told you that emulation is the center part of every engineer's work. You need to be able to generate data and test your process. Doesn't matter even what algorithm you're going to run on your data. You just need to be able to check. Here, what we're saying, look, you have this very complicated deep learning algorithm. This encoder can be complicated. This decoder can, can be complicated. As long as your information bottleneck happens to be of low dimensionality, relative low dimensionality, you're all set. That's really uh, uh, the point. And, 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 uh, and, and this is, um, I think, a pretty interesting uh, uh, approach to generate data. I'll briefly mention GANs. Uh, GANs are uh, um, short for generative adversarial networks. Uh, the idea is that you have, uh, uh, you have images, real images, for example, or real data. And then you have fake data that you generate, and it's not. And what you like to do is you like to co-train a decision uh, aspect that tells you if it's real or fake. You want to make it difficult uh, for, for uh, as difficult as possible uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to train, uh, to decide if it's real or fake. So this is, uh, you, you have one network that decides real or fake, and you have one network that tries to generate. So the, the, the generator network gets punished whenever uh, the, the, the detector network tells it that it was able to detect that it's fake. So it will try to, it gets as input, say random, uh, random uh, uh, in this case, just random noise, and it gets an input and it tries to generate from this noise something that looks as much as possible as, in this case, an image. So, so the point of the whole exercise is that you train G to look like this. And you train D to detect between what you get here and the images. So there's a competition between the two. D tries to detect whether it's artificial or not. G tries to make the artificial look as much realistic as possible. And this is another way to, to generate data. So, so the point of this whole exercise is co-training. You train G, G and D at the same time, and you try to make uh, D's life as difficult as possible with G. Okay. And guns do work, by the way. Uh, yes? Uh, how can we generate labels in this structure? So, so uh, think about it like that. I can generate, uh, I mean, so you can z here can be uh, x comma y. Yeah, but the y dimension will be one compared to yeah, the exactly. future dimension. Exactly. To to I, I agree, but uh, that's something you can do. You can also just uh, uh, try to stratify. So if there are, you know, um, the number of cows here is whatever, then I will just try to generate cows now. Okay. And I'll try to make the, the artificial cow look as much as possible as a, as a real cow. So, so guns are, are a bit more difficult to train, but if you, I mean, the code is out there, it's known how to, to be done, you can do it, and you can use it for your own applications. Okay. So I want to mention something about biased variance uh, trade-off here. Uh, so the biased variance trade-off turns out to be quite different than what it used to be. Uh, so the network size is often huge. The largest networks are in the, um, are, I think I've seen 540 billion parameters with a B. Uh, you cannot fit them even on a, on a on, I think it takes something like, like 20 or 25 for the largest GPUs fully connected. So the network size can be really large. Uh, and, and the network uh, uh, may just memorize all data. In fact, you can show that in some cases it does. It does memorize uh, uh, the data. And then there is uh, uh, all sort of tricks that you can use, uh, early termination, uh, like we saw in trees, 
Uh, you can regularize the weight, so you can try to make the weights not too, too large. You can do, do dropouts, you can use guns, you can do different things uh, to make the network uh, regular. You just need to be aware of that. That if you don't do those tricks, and, and those are tricks that you'll have to do with your uh, hyperparameter search, then what you can end up with is essentially remembering or memorizing everything that you've, that you've seen. And that's not what you want to do. Okay. So just summary. Um, I mean, you can talk a lot about deep learning, but it's really about having good data with high quality labels. Uh, and a lot of data usually. The, the, you can, the point of the whole exercise was to create features automatically. And that's exactly what it does. But for that, you'll need a lot of data. And if you have that, you can also generate data that would look like the data that you, that, uh, uh, you got. And it dominates voice, image, video, uh, everything that we know about, for example, um, speech generation, image generation, uh, video compressing, uh, it is dominated by, by, um, uh, by deep learning uh, uh, today. And I should mention that there are uh, um, auto uh, automatic, um, automatic uh, um, uh, tools uh, written here and others that you can use. Uh, you don't really don't need to, uh, to write the algorithms yourself at uh, this day and age. Um, and uh, those tools are pretty good. I mean, they have their own realization, like they know what they're doing, you get the data, and, and they do a lot of, of the work uh, for you. With our, and there are many others. I don't want to offend anyone, so uh, it's a partial list. Um, before we move on, are there any questions? All right. So I want to, I want to talk about the third family of, of, of models. Uh, which are ensemble methods. And the reason that I wanted to get into it is because I want to describe the last few slide, perhaps, of, uh, of this part, the absolute winner of, of Kaggle competitions. So we'll get to that. Remember that we talked about, uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, decision trees? So if you have multiple trees, how do we call it? Forest, right? So multiple trees are a forest. So the question is really, how do I build from trees, which we said we really like, how do I build a, a, single, a single entity which we call a forest? So uh, there are several ideas here that we need to collect. Uh, the first one is boosting. Uh, boosting here uh, means that um, uh, you, you take your data, you train a classifier. In this case, it's pretty not, not a very clever one. It's a decision stump. And, and then whenever you make a mistake, so for example, your cl the classifier here made a mistake on this uh, uh, plus and, uh, and uh, made, made mistakes uh, here on the minuses, so, so basically, you make, it, you make the samples larger. So you, you give them more weight. So the plus here is bigger, and the minus here is bigger. So now you train another classifier, and now you have some other mistakes. So you make this, you return it to the previous size, and you make that smaller, but now you have to make this bigger. And eventually, you, you make another classifier, and you combine uh, all of them uh, together. So this is known as boosting. It's an approach where you reweigh re your data to make uh, tougher uh, data points to be uh, to look uh, more more uh, more significant. Okay, so you can you have the original data. You can partition it uh, to multiple aspects, and then you, the, all those aspects that's called uh, uh, aggregating. So we have the bootstrapping and we have the the aggregating. So together we'll have bootstrapping, aggregating, and that's what you can also do. You can have, and when you do that together, you get what's called an, an ensemble classifier. Okay, and that's really the, the way historically things work. So we have decision trees. Once you take multiple decision trees together, uh, you divide your data, uh, we call that bagging, you get to a forest. Then uh, you, you re there was a realization that the forest does not treat points which are more complicated uh, in different ways. So it went to boosting. Boosting means that you, we emphasize hard, hard points, but it was difficult to, uh, uh, to um, uh, it was difficult to optimize. That's led to gradient boosting. So gradient boosting is a way to use uh, gradient descent to, uh, uh, to solve things sequentially, and that led to XGBoost. So XGBoost is an algorithm you have to try for every problem that you're trying to solve, because that's a winning algorithm in, in many applications. Um, so basically, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an optimized uh, version. 
um, use uh, it, it combines tree pruning, uh, it knows how to, to handle missing values, knows how to regularize and avoid overfitting bias. Uh, so just to explain, um, I get, I have my data set, I put some of it in, into and build a tree. Um, then I'll look at the residual. So this residual is going to emphasize points which are not classified by the first tree. And then I, I get, I, I build uh, another tree and so forth and so forth. And then I combine them, uh, everything together. That's, that is XGBoost. It's a very simple algorithm. It has uh, several very, very strong uh, implementations. Doesn't have too many meta, meta hyperparameters. So I just need to, to know uh, what is going to be the, 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 the depth of the tree. Not too sensitive to that. How many trees I'm going to have, not too sensitive to that. And how I will combine. This is uh, one particular way to combine it. There are other, other ways to, uh, to do so. Okay. So to conclude uh, uh, regarding ensemble methods. So XGBoost wins more Kaggle competition than any other single algorithm. Okay. And that's uh, something like historically it stands around 35% of, uh, of the of, uh, Kaggle competition. So that's pretty impressive. Um, and, and the key to make it work is that you need to have strong features. You need to engineer your features uh, well. Yeah, it, it can work uh, on structure problems as well. So you, you can have categorical data, you can have numerical data, you can, you can have both, you can have images, you can have whatever you like. You can just put it in, uh, through the sausage factory and you get, uh, uh, you get results. Um, I should say that hyperparameter search does not give you a lot of value here. So it's not that you're going to get fundamentally another, something that didn't work and suddenly it's going to work. You can get a few percents, which might be good, but still, you don't really need to, to work very hard for it. Now, what about compute memory prior knowledge? So compute, that's almost trivial, right? I mean, you only need to develop maybe 20 trees, not so much, not a big problem. Memory, you need to remember 20 trees, not really a problem. Prior knowledge, you need to have good features. So everything boils down to if you have good features, and you ask what algorithm you should use, well, use XGBoost. If you just need to use one algorithm that you, then in, in, your, in, your, in your PhD thesis, probably it should be XGBoost. Okay. Not as fancy, perhaps, as, uh, as, uh, as, as, uh, as deep learning, but, uh, but it, it works uh, quite well and, and often out of the box. Okay. So, let's see the timing. Um, so we have 10 minutes. Should we start now or? Uh, or we can start now. Let's start now, and uh, I'll just do the cover the first uh, thing. Okay. Okay. So, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about X-Res, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, unsupervised learning, which we haven't uh, uh, touched uh, uh, yet. Uh, after lunch, we'll talk about uh, EM and, uh, and a little bit about uh, uh, reinforcement learning. And, um, and in terms of X-Res, then, there's one thing you should always uh, do. You should always visualize your data. Uh, you should always try to look at it, but sometimes your data is very hard to look at, right? Sometimes it's in you know, 20 dimensions. How do I look at something that is 20 dimensions? Um, so in unsupervised learning, we want to visualize, if possible, discover structure, but and also clean data. Uh, much of the work that we do with data is to clean it, uh, and that's something that you need to, we need to realize. Uh, so, so I'm going, not going to cover, of course, everything. That's, uh, I'm just going to, to, give, uh, uh, to give you a, a glimpse of uh, things that are out there. So let's talk about, uh, about clustering. I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen uh, some version of this, uh, of this graph. I give you data and I ask you like, what should this, how do you divide it to two parts? There are no labels here. So, you know, there are many algorithms. We're not going to go into all of them. Um, I mean, tell me what you think it makes the most sense. Sometimes it's even hard to say. Um, so, um, I mean, I think many of you have seen uh, spectral clustering and Gaussian mixture clustering, um, I'm going to talk today about dbscan because it's a really nice algorithm. Mm -hmm. It works very well, and I think it's underappreciated. By the way, uh, you can often uh, use this to create labels. So you can, if you, you can take this the data that initially 
has no no uh, no colors and and just they decide cluster one is plus cluster two is is minus and 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 and, and work work with that okay so db scan is a uh, is a heuristic algorithm that uh, uh, works really well when you have a low dimensional data and uh, where dense where, where the data is dense where where, uh, where it's interesting uh, so, so the idea is, is that basically is, is to uh, uh, divide the points to types. So basically, each dense area is, is uh, we view it at the, at, the, um, at, at, the, at, the, at the cluster. So this is going to be a cluster, this is going to be a cluster, and this is going to be a cluster. This we're not sure, so we're probably going to call it noise. And, and we work uh, sequentially. So, so basically, uh, you take a, a point and you, you decide whether or not it's a, it's a dense point or it's a, um, uh, it's a sort of um, um, an, uh, it's, it's a, a border point or whether it's just noise. So in this case, this is a um, sort of, uh, there's a parameter that uh, the look at uh, four points in your neighborhood. So you say, well, this looks like part of the, of the, of the, uh, this, is a, this, was, um, this is a core, there are many points here. And, uh, um, and noise points are, are, are uh, there's nothing there. So we just say, well, it's not con connected to anyone, so let's uh, ignore it. And then there are relationship between the points. Uh, I'll let you read it, uh, uh, not now, but, um, but later. But I mean, I think you understand how this works. Basically, you try to build larger and larger scans, larger and larger clusters. If something is not in, in, is not, does not uh, belong to any, anywhere, then you're just going to, uh, uh, to ditch it. Um, so so dbscan is one approach. Uh, another algorithm that I'm sure you've used, uh, you've seen is, is PCA. Uh, PCA, principal component analysis, I divide my, I, I look at the projections of my data, I look at the one which has uh, the most energy, that's going to be the first principal component, and then I'm going to project uh, uh, onto it, that's the first principal component. The second principal component is going to be uh, orthogonal and we'll have the remaining data and, and uh, basically uh, as, 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 uh, as I do it in multiple dimensions, I try to capture as much variance as possible. So I capture the most variance, that's going to be first principal component, then the second most variance, then the second principal component and so forth. That's an approach I'm sure uh, you've seen, just know that it's not, doesn't have to be linear. Okay, so you can do it uh, in a non-linear fashion. Uh, this is uh, with uh, uh, in a kernelized fashion. So this is a, a polynomial kernel, which is Gaussian, Gaussian kernel, or real basis function. So you can do different things that are like that. And and this is a very common preprocessing approach. Like it's very common that somebody gives you data. You first you you do a, a PCA uh, just to see what, what what's happening, just to be able to visualize. Okay, so this is sort of uh, uh, 1970s, uh, but, uh, but what people are really doing today is they're looking at things called TSNI or uh, T-distributed stochastic neighborhood embedding. Um, and that's an algorithm you should, you should be familiar with. So the idea that you have um, uh, high dimensional data and you, you want to find a low dimensional re representation such that if you look at the, if we call uh, PJ given I uh, to be the, the um, exponential of the of the distance between the um, between the two, uh, sigma is a parameter, and we symmetrize it, and you look at the, at something similar in in, in terms of um, uh, of the, of the uh, Euclidean distance for y, the low dimensional. They want to mi to to minimize this uh, k L divergence between uh, those two distributions. So what what do I mean by that? Basically, if something is close in in high dimensions. So if the, the distance, this metric is small between i and j and j and i, then I, I want the distance in low dimensions to be small as well. And if something is high, I don't really care. But I want this to be, uh, to represent, the, 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 to preserve the distance in high dimensions to be in low dimensions. That's my dream, right? If I know how to do that, I solve the problem. Okay, so how would that, uh, uh, oh, from an algorithmic perspective, it turns out that you can, you can have a, a, very, a, very nice, uh, um, a very nice gradient algorithm. The gradient algorithm is over the y, so y, i, y, j. And basically you can take your data, go through it many times, call, uh, pick i and j, do some, uh, uh, and, and modify the, uh, the locations of y, i, and y, j. 
and it seems to be working very well. The code is out there. Computationally, it runs pretty fast, um, uh, as long as the computing the metric is, 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 is easy. So this is an example of, uh, of Tisney embeddings of uh, the digits 0 to 9 from the zip code data. And what we see here is that uh, um, the zeros are, and the distance that it was taken was simply the Euclidean distance between, uh, between images. Um, so um, uh, zeros are together, sixes together, and so forth. And, and you know, it even makes sense that uh, threes and nines are together, and maybe twos and eight are together, because they're kind of similar. And the distance here is actually the Euclidean distance. So if I would show you this picture and ask you how many clusters do you have here, what would you say? You would probably say 10, right? Uh, uh, so what, what we see here is that um, um, we can embed pretty, pretty complicated objects pretty quickly uh, using something like that. And that's also something you should, you should always do if you have data and if you have a metric in high dimension. Uh, that might be a big if, but you need this metric. If you have a metric that can, uh, that can tell you uh, which two objects are, are, are close, then this is going to, to work well for you. OK. So uh, let's see. Okay, so we con we'll continue after, uh, after lunch. <laughs> and that's dealing with uh, missing, missing data. So, so often, especially when you have real data, some of it is missing, and then um, essentially at some point you cannot do anything with the data. So, so we use uh, things like EM, uh, and there is an example, uh, example here uh, that uh, uh, to uh, essentially complete data that we don't have. So we take uh, uh, the missing entries in our, in our vectors, we complete them, we recalculated uh, uh, the vector with uh, made up data, and we repeat the process. And that's uh, something that, if you don't know, you should be aware of, because often people just tend to, um, uh, to throw away data. That's, uh, that's not good uh, uh, for anyone. Uh, so this is just, just, uh, just a comment about uh, using the M. It's a very practical. Uh, and you should keep it in mind that uh, uh, no, no piece of data should go uh, uh, to waste. Okay. Um, so, so what I'm going to do now, uh, before we move to talking about uh, some application in re renewable energy, I'm going to uh, very briefly go through um, uh, one of the major advances in, uh, in uh, reinforcement learning in recent years. I remind you that this is a, we have an environment and an agent. The agent uh, chooses actions. Uh, as a result, the environment uh, changes state, the agent uh, gets to observe the state or some function of it, and uh, a reward. So, so I'm, going to, I'm going to briefly cover things uh, uh, because I don't have time, and I, I know that you have the slides, but I want to uh, explain the, uh, the concept of uh, tree search and how to use uh, MCTS and CTS Monte Carlo uh, tree search. Uh, so uh, tree search, uh, so this is uh, uh, what I mean, game tree search, this is a sort of um, what's known as alpha beta pruning. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a very old concept in AI. Basically, I, I, I start with what is my current state, and then I, I'm, I'm going to uh, expand on, what, uh, uh, on, the, on player one, then player two, player one, player two. And, and you can easily see that this is going to explode very quickly, very, very fast. So uh, what people are doing, well, th they're building a value function. And I don't need to play the chess game all the way to know that if I lost the queen, I'm not in a good situation. So basically, once if I, after three steps, I'm going to lose the queen, I'm going to say, well, that's it. I'm not going to develop uh, the tree anymore because that's probably um, a disaster. So, so uh, this is a good heuristic uh, when the value function is known or when, it, when, it, when it's easy. Uh, to use and uh, when the branching factor is uh, modest. So basically the tree here only grows by a factor of two. That's not too bad. When the branching factor is large, uh, then it's, um, it's uh, quite a disaster. So basically I can only develop the tree one or two steps uh, into the future. So this is sort of con conventional uh, tree search. Um, Go on the other hand is much tougher for computers. Uh, Go, to those of you who don't know, there is a, the, the board uh, an, an adult size board is 19 by 19. You have uh, uh, black pieces and, and white pieces. Um, and, um, and basically, um, in Go, uh, whenever you surround, say, if the white surrounds the black, then the black go away and become white. So, and what's interesting about Go is that um, um, it, there is a high branching factor, and at least um, there is no known good heuristic. Like, you cannot count the number of pieces, the number of pieces can be quite meaningless because a single move at the end 
that everybody knows that will happen can, you know, can change everything. So if you have just, you know, all of your whites, but then there are blacks that surround it, then even though you have more whites, uh, the black is going to win. And this is a quote, a famous quote from one of the founders of, uh, of AI, uh, Jonathan uh, 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 Schaefer, and, you know, I'll, I'll let you ponder upon for a minute. Okay. So, uh, Monte Carlo Research, MTTS, uh, it's, an algorithm, it's an algorithm that revolutionized uh, um, computer Go. Um, and uh, the, the idea is that basically you want, the more, it's, the more cycles that you spend, the better you are. Usually, uh, lean log uh, improvement, so you get a linear factor as you double the, um, uh, the CPU time. And uh, it's an anytime algorithm, so whenever you stop, uh, basically you get something that is reasonable. And uh, the idea is that uh, uh, you, you do a tree search, you select which node to, to expand, and then you perform rollouts from this node many times, and then back, you back up the value of the tree. Um, so let's see how uh, the tree would look like. So here there is a tree. There, this, is a, this looks like a really promising uh, option. This looks like a, a promising option. So you develop them uh, some more, and there are other options, and you see that there are most of the options you hardly develop them at all because they don't look uh, uh, too promising. So, so basically you choose what uh, elements of the tree to develop and then you dig some more. Okay, um, and then uh, um, Go is deterministic but the high branching factor. Uh, mind sweeping is probabilistic but still the branching factor is small so you can use it uh, uh, as well. And there are other games here which I think you probably know of. Um, this is a, a version of Risk. Uh, uh, this is a, a, um, some, some car racing. I think this is Doom. Or it's in Unreal, and this is uh, Pac-Man, uh, part of the Atari, uh, Atari games. Okay, so, so uh, oh, this is not what I sent to you. Okay, um, so uh, basically, um, um, you, what you want to do is you want to play a lot of games. You want to start with, uh, with uh, legal moves, and, uh, and once you, you win, you want to develop it some more. But you don't want to develop it too much because then you're not going to develop other things. And, um, and that is uh, sort of um, uh, the idea. In, in is that my presentation? I sent such a nice presentation on, on my Mac. Um, okay, um, never mind. Um, so uh, basically, uh, it's, um, this is just showing uh, how, what to do. You open the tree. Uh, here I have uh, uh, five pieces. I, I want to decide where to put the six, uh, the sixth one, the additional white. And then you can see that I open it to the tree. I simulate, and then there are outcomes. OK. All right. And then basically, uh, we, have, uh, um, we use simulation directly. And then uh, the issue is that simulations are noisy, so you need to run um, many simulations. You need to average. And then the issue is that basically, if you know, under those conditions here, which when you look at the slide, I'm sure it's going to look better, uh, if you can do 1 million moves per second, which is not a, not a, a small number, uh, you can only do 25 evals uh, per second, which is not a lot. Uh, so, um, and that was why Monte Carlo uh, was ignored because it just that didn't scale well. Even if you have multiple, uh, multiple, uh, um, uh, multiple uh, CPUs, it's it's hard to uh, work with, to make it go to large number of evals. Okay. Now that that's that's not readable. Um, it, th does that look like that on the screen too? Yeah. And also in my screen, uh, so, okay. so must be a, uh, a Mac kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. but I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, okay, so, so that's fine. I, I'll talk a little bit about, um, uh, about um, okay. Would, would you like okay. us to actually get the PDF? No, that's okay. Let's, uh, let's go here. Um, so, so here is a, a, an idea. So this idea is uh, called... Um, um, so there is this problem called the multi-armed bandit problem. Have you heard of it? So one-armed bandit, you know, the uh, slot machines that you play and lose money, and you know, old old people lose a lot of money, and young people too. So so the, the multi-armed bandit that you have multiple such machines, and you don't know which machine is going to is better. So you have multiple options, mm -hmm. all stationary. A priori, you don't know what to do. Like there are let's suppose there are, there are k. Um, 
uh, there are k, uh, k machines, you choose machine two, you get a reward, which is a stationary random variable distributed in unknown fashion. So if you have infinity, which is a long time, then you can just sample each of them many times, decide which one is the best, and just use this one. But we don't have infinity. We only have that much time. So how do you, how, what, what can we do? Well, we, we can do the following. We can say, well, you know, let's estimate the value of uh, each arm, each option, and then give some, some bonus for arms which you haven't estimated often enough. And this is what's written here. So I estimate the value, then there is a per parameter here, and then I, I count how many times I visited each, uh, each, each arm, and then I, 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 uh, oh, each parent, and then how, how much I visited this particular, uh, particular arm. Okay, so, so, so what do we know about this algorithm? This algorithm is, let's agree, it's very easy to, to, to do, right? I mean, all that I need to do is, is estimate the value and, count, and, and, and maintain counts. Um, it's, uh, it turned out to be um, uh, optimal in the sense that from all possible algorithms, this is an algorithm that minimizes w the so-called regret or alternatively maximizes your cumulative uh, return. Um, so, so the issue that uh, uh, this algorithm really, what happens is that the arm that turns out to be the best arm, you will identify it at some point, and then you'll just keep hammering uh, on it. You just keep sampling it more and more and more, until at some point, uh, uh, I mean, you, you essentially sample only this arm, but occasionally, rarely, the, this number of visits for other arms is going to be large enough, so you're going to uh, sample them some more. So, um, um, so the, the idea is that uh, um, um, basically uh, using a, such an algorithm for the, the multi-unbanded problems uh, can be used to explore a tree. And this realization has been a bit surprising. So, um, okay, so, so what, uh, hmm. okay, let me, okay, so let me, I mean, you'll read the details, but uh, so I'll, I'll focus here on, on what's interesting here. So basically, there is this border. Uh, this are, those are the arms that uh, we need to, we know what we're doing here. Like, we know what's better and, what, and, and what, uh, what's worse. We decide that we want to develop this guy here. This is uh, what we think is the best, is, is a likely candidate to be the best arm. Now we're going to sample it uh, many times, maybe 100 times, maybe 200 times, and uh, we add it to the tree. So basically, if we s decide to add uh, n, then we'll say, well, now we know what's happening here. We have a good estimate. Okay. So, so uh, uh, the algorithm has, uh, or every such algorithm has uh, essentially uh, four decisions. So the selection, which are the nodes that we want to, uh, uh, to, to uh, later to consider expanding. The expansion, here I decide to expand uh, this node. Then the simulation, usually random simulation. And then back propagation. Let's suppose that here I sampled it, I, 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 I won. That's good. Now I can bro back propagate, and you see the numbers change. So if before I, I won, uh, sorry, I lost. If I won three out of three, now I win three out of four. And here before I won seven out of 10, now I win seven out of, uh, of 11. So basically remember that all that I need to do to, to, to perform well is to choose the best guy here. I don't need to know what will happen all the way. I just need to, make, to choose an action in the tree that will be uh, best, for, uh, uh, best for now. And uh, that, so that's uh, 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 a more detailed explanation which you can read uh, uh, later on. Um, okay. All right, no, that's not good. Okay. So, so you'll read about it later in the PDF. Uh, I think there is uh, not, not much. Yeah, I, I just want to briefly talk about DQN. Uh, so DQN, there are two families of RL algorithms. One is uh, um, DeepQ networks, and the other is uh, policy gradients, so, um, and different versions. I'll, I'll do some name dropping. Uh, maybe P you've heard of PPO or, or TRPO. But we'll talk about DQN, made a, a large impact. And, and the, the idea is, is basically this very simple. Uh, you have a value function that can be enrolled uh, recursively, so this is the value of, of a state S using action A. That's written here. And you it turns out that the optimal value function can be enrolled uh, recursively. That's a nonlinear equation where Q star is the best, it's the optimal value function. That's not the Bellman equation. 
And the algorithm is, is quite simple. You, you do this value iteration, you solve the Bellman uh, equation, and that's qi plus one, that's in the i plus one iteration, equals uh, what's, written, what's written here. So basically, uh, you're, you're trying to uh, uh, solve uh, the optimal value function by mimicking uh, and using value iteration. And as long as, uh, as the number of states and actions is small and finite, everything works well. Okay. But in, you want to, if you want to represent uh, um, the, the Q function or the Q network um, by, by deep learning, then of course you can, things will not uh, work, work, work uh, precisely. So what you can do is you can look at this loss function and optimize it. So you have this, this Q function, you have the target, which is the reward plus um, gamma times the maximum of, uh, of the target. And that leads to the following Q learning algorithm known for, I think, at least from the uh, early 90s, uh, that is, uh, the, the loss function is uh, uh, the derivative of the loss function. You can, is simply uh, the derivative of the Q uh, times uh, what's written here. This is just uh, deriving. You can optimize using stochastic gradient descent, have a complex network, and everybody is, everybody is happy. Uh, there are some issues, though. The one issue is that you get oscillation and divergence. Um, and um, th that's because of what's written here, the data is sequential. Uh, so basically there are correlation between the data because if I'm at state S, uh, I'm moving, I'm, I cannot change to a, a, an arbitrary state, but rather to, to a, a, a relatively close uh, state. Uh, the policy changes uh, uh, relatively rapidly. Uh, so because the policy is to choose at every action, the, uh, every state, the action that maximizes the Q, if the Q changes a bit, the policy can change by a lot. And you, a priori, you don't know what the scales of the, of the Q value. So basically, you can get very, very large gradients. So this is an example for the actual problem that we get when you try to solve, use deep learning to solve uh, uh, non-vanilla non pro non issues. So there are uh, really, uh, um, um, for each, I mean, in the, the, the paper that uh, I, I mentioned, uh, there, uh, there is a proposed solution to each of those issues. Uh, um, to, one of approach is that we don't, we decorrelate uh, the data by using a, a replay buffer. So we take a, a buffer of samples and we collect the sample and then uh, we, we sort of uh, look at every sample separately uh, from the experience uh, replay. To avoid the oscillation, we freeze uh, uh, the Q network and uh, then we clip uh, reward or normalize them somehow uh, to make sure every, everything is, um, is stable. So, uh, I mean, those are not really important aspects. The only thing that I want to, the reason I want to show it to you is that there will be problems when you try to train a deep network. And those problems have solutions. And you need to figure out what is really the problem and to look, search in the literature to find what other people have, uh, have done. Uh, correlation, which is something that we often get from temporal data, can be, you, you can break it uh, with experience replay. Oscillations can often be uh, trained by freezing part of your network. And you always need to think about uh, what you're trying to optimize uh, by clipping uh, or normalizing. And, and again, the details are uh, less important. I'm going to uh, let you read it uh, offline. What I do want to discuss briefly is uh, uh, RLE in Atari. Uh, so was, but, I mean, I think most of you are too young, but there used to be some, something called Atari. I uh, used to play uh, uh, some games. The games are here. Like this is Space Invaders. Uh, very simple, uh, very simple games. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, lots of wasted time in my childhood. Um, and just to, to explain how DQN and Atari works, and there, this is a, a, a stack of uh, the last four frames. Um, and that goes into a conv layer, uh, and then another conv layer, and then a hidden unit and a fully connected layer. And there are only four actions in Atari. So it's, you can go up, up down, uh, right, left, and then you can click the buttons, and that's about it. Um, so, so it's a very, I mean, the network is not really complicated, but it's also not uh, trivial. And do note that there is no semantic parsing. So you just take the image. Like you don't try to understand it. Just take the last four images, and that's it. And that, 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 those were the initial results uh, in Atari. Um, those are different games. Uh, in, uh, this is a, a human level. Um, uh, and, and those are the games where, um, where it was pretty difficult. Like uh, the original paper was unable to succeed. And 
But since then, have no fear, all games, in all games, uh, uh, humans are never going to play better than computers. Uh, and, and there are, I mean, there are a sequence of papers which I'm not going to, uh, to discuss now, uh, where, where basically um, every such game were needed, needed some, uh, uh, some modification. And uh, those modifications uh, are now, uh, are, are now uh, um, by now standard. So in all the Atari games, uh, uh, this, this happened uh, more or less uh, at, uh, I think, in the last uh, five years. OK. Now what happens if I press? OK, good. So this is a, a game known as um, um, a Breakout. Uh, I'm sure you, everybody knows what's going on, right? You played it, you wasted your time on this. So, so you see what happens. Initially, it's pretty, the puck is pretty bad, right? Do, do anyone, does anyone remember what's the best thing to do in this game? Sorry? Yeah, you need to go up and dig a tunnel. And once you get, you've, you've dug a tunnel, then basically the, the, the ball is going to go like this. Uh, and this is ex exactly what is, uh, uh, what is learned here. So you see now it's pretty good. And um, so it's, it's called tunneling. Um, okay. uh, by the way, it's, it always tunnels from the left. Um, not just in this video, in, in general. That's uh, okay. So now it's pretty good. Okay. So, so what is the message here? So I mean, this is something that I could, you know, probably explain in words. And if you see this policy, you can explain it in words as well. But it's really a deep network that is doing everything. There are about, uh, I don't remember even how many, thousands of weights. And, and you know, this is it. Like, think about a problem where you have control. How would you convince someone to trust what you're doing? I mean, this seems, OK, so it does very well in the demo. But what about not demo? OK, so I'm not, I don't have time to go for alpha 0. So uh, uh, Spiris, if you can move to the part 5, you can read it. I think it's pretty clear. Um, and in alpha 0, it's just uh, using uh, trees uh, to, um, uh, uh, to solve uh, Go. It's very impressive, but time is limited. OK, so, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, t to tell you about uh, where to get started and then give you some examples about uh, problem in renewable energy. Uh, so demo process, remember, it's always get data. Get data and, and, and make either really enough data. Do you have enough? And, and remember, we talked, we said how to do it. You can emulate. You can emulate your process and you can get a good handle on whether or not you have enough data. Clean it if, you, if, you, if possible and certainly visualize it. There are many examples known that people haven't visualized your da their data and that's, uh, that led to a, a disaster. Before you start everything, you need to define your objective and how you validate what you're doing. And you, know, you saw that today we talked about some very specific ML problems. Uh, obviously, this is not everything. You need to identify what is the problem that you want to solve or, or problems that you want to solve and, and, and figure out uh, what are good algorithms for that. OK. And I'll, I'll repeat whole thing for the last time, emulate. You, you need to emulate the data in the system if you cannot solve the emulated system, there is no point in looking at real data. Okay? That, that it, it, I mean, if you cannot solve a problem where you, where you actually understand how the data were generated, uh, um, the, there is no point in, in moving forward. Okay. Uh, so which algorithm to choose? So you should always start with the classic, KNN, logistic, linear models, XGBoost. Figure out what's your memory compute uh, burden uh, and what is the prior knowledge that you, you have. My recommendation is to use scikit-learn. Uh, it's a very co convenient and powerful uh, Python lab that, um, library, but there's, there are many others. And you know, one thing that I'll share with my, from my experience is usually deep learning does not buy you a lot. So usually it's going to buy you 2%, 3%, not much more. And the costs can be quite high uh, in terms of, uh, if, of time, if, if nothing else. OK. Uh, the ecosystem, uh, just remember that algorithms are just one part. Sometimes we like to focus on algorithms because we feel most comfortable there. But this is just one component and probably not the most important one. Testing is more important, validation is more important. And uh, you, you, I mean, 
you really don't, should not write an algorithm on your own. Like this is not, this is like writing, uh, writing HTML code. I mean, you don't need to do this. I mean, there are people that do it for a living. It's not you. Uh, so uh, uh, usually uh, you should not write it uh, on your own. And then always uh, start with a, um, with a look of, of your data. That's always a uh, good advice. Okay, just a, a list of framework. I'm not going to, uh, to, uh, uh, to vote for anyone. Uh, lots of framework and lots of other frameworks out there, so uh, use whatever uh, you wish. Uh, but uh, as I said, don't, 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 don't do anything on your own. Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit about uh, renewable energy and, and where, can it, uh, 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 where, where, where do we use machine learning. So basically everything forecasting is something that we use uh, uh, machine learning, whether it's solar or wind or, or whatever. Uh, that's from uh, um, um, de demand forecasting, uh, supply forecasting, uh, congestion forecasting. Everything that uh, um, is, is forecasting related uh, is something that, that uh, is, is, we use machine learning for. Um, um, but there is also uh, the point of view of the system operator. So the system operator, whether it's a TSO, an ISO, uh, an integrated uh, uh, operator, uh, uh, what have you, uh, they, have, uh, uh, they need to decide uh, how, to, how to control the network. And this control problem is very much uh, a machine learning uh, problem. It's optimization, there is a market aspect, there is a design aspect. All of them uh, fit very well into the machine learning uh, um, pipeline just because uh, there's so much noise in the system and so much uncertainty, I don't think I need to, to tell you about that. Okay, so, so the, the stages that, uh, that we saw, uh, um, the pre-processing of data, the feature selection, the model development, all that stages are you know, normal data flow stages and, and you should figure out where, uh, where you are at the stage and you should make sure that uh, your stage is, is validated. Um, just to give you an example, this is a, a, a prediction architecture for demand. So here are the inputs, um, different features, uh, temperature, humidity, and so forth, but also categorical, like day of the week, by the way, a major uh, parameter in terms of, uh, of demand prediction. Uh, hour of the day, month of the year, season, and so forth. Uh, you can always try to convert something to a number, but there is really no point in saying that Saturday is six or seven or whatever. I mean, it's Saturday. Saturday is different than Sunday, right? And, and, and there are, uh, then there are other events like a working day. So for example, today happens to be a holiday in the States. So this is a very special day. Okay? Whether or not you think it's, it's important, that's a different story, but that's different, definitely part of the, of the input. And then we have uh, use parameters, uh, often uh, auto-aggressive parameters from previous day, previous hour, previous whatever, uh, um, uh, things that have come from the previous week and so forth. So, so usually there are those uh, um, um, ambient parameters, uh, the, there are the energy use parameters, and you, we take all that, uh, those parameters, put it in some, some network or some other uh, regressor, and then we get a predicted day ahead uh, demand. So this is sort of an, an, an age scheme. I, I'll just mention a cute trick that is very useful. Uh, when you look at the, at the uh, cyclical uh, parameters such as such as hour, hour of the day or month of the year, it's often very convenient to look at the angle if you think about it as in terms of, uh, of cosine. So let me explain. If, uh, if this is 24 hours, then you know, there is no, usually there is not, no big difference between midnight and uh, a minute before midnight. Right? So, so the angle here or the cosine of the angle, that makes sense to be a parameter. So often, when you have cyclical parameters, such as, uh, as, as an hour, the, 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 line, the number is arbitrary, especially in, in the limit. So what often people do is they look at, the, at uh, uh, the angle or the difference of the angle to... Uh, um, so, so there are lots of tricks and of the trade, and I think in, in, there are quite a few papers that are using those. Uh, weather has a special, uh, a special place. Um, so um, I don't know how much uh, uh, people here know about, uh, about uh, uh, weather, but basically you can try to do a very local prediction. Uh, for example, this is for day ahead solar uh, irradiance, uh, and, and, and this is something that people are using uh, both uh, 
uh, uh, satellite imagery, uh, simulation, and, uh, and some uh, con contextual parameters. Um, the reasons I'm mentioning uh, this is especially because of the, of the solar simulation. So we do have very good uh, data sources, and we have, do have simulations that we may not even really understand where they're coming from. So simulations are out there. Um, and, and the question is, how do you take that into account? So, if, for example, if you use WORF, you have multiple simulations. So you can take those into account, have this uh, geographical um, um, notes, put it into um, an, um, an MLP. You can even have an uncertainty estimator here, auto decoder, and then you can estimate uh, the, in this case, the solar irradiance, but it, this, those uh, uh, work also for, for wind uh, on a very uh, uh, WORF type grid. So it's a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid on, on a global scale. Um, this is uh, those are it's pr this is probably the best usage I've seen for uh, uh, continents. Um, it's really a very local phenomenon, right? I mean, there's a, it's a, and, and, and this is this gives pretty good performance uh, all in all. So you can you can estimate uh, uh, solar radiance and wind uh, quite uh, quite effectively. Okay, so I, I want to talk about a relatively simple case study. Um, the, the reference is here. Uh, the goal of, 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 uh, is to uh, uh, understand, to, they, they have used uh, um, several algorithms uh, for production of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of wind power. So this is a very simple problem, and, and this is what, how the data would look like. This is the wind speed. Uh, we see here in uh, orange the ideal uh, calculated power theoretically, and this is uh, the power in kilowatts. So, so when you plot the data, you see something that is immediately striking, right? I mean, there is... So what's happening here in type 1? Maintenance. Sorry? Maintenance. Maintenance, downtime, something is, is not working, right? And then you have uh, type, uh, type 2, which is, you know, there is a... Um, this, this is, like, what is happening here? Anyone can guess? Probably curtailment, that's true. And what is happening on time three? This is dispersed over all, er, 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 everywhere. It's probably sensor error, maybe something else, but probably your sensors are, are, are erroneous. So, so the question is, uh, uh, this is w w what, I mean, you still want to get a, a prediction, so the question is how, how would you go about it? So for example, you can do um, uh, here um, the predicted power and, and the real power. And this is, this is with uh, KNN. I don't, I don't even remember what K was. So you have K and then, you know, it's a bit better, but obviously it, it gets shifted a little bit. It gets shifted to, uh, um, uh, to the right. So it's not bad, but also not, uh, uh, not great. And then uh, this was done with decision trees. Um, obviously it doesn't capture anything about what is happening here about the downtime. It doesn't capture uh, much and al also uh, because we were using uh, decision trees, uh, we get a, a smudge uh, here, uh, probably because uh, th there were some samples, didn't know where to capture, uh, where to uh, uh, allocate them. This is what happened. And then when you use XGBoost, uh, uh, we managed, they managed to, uh, uh, to get a lot of the samples here, right? A lot of the maintenance because they had some feature that was indi indicative, indicative of, uh, of maintenance. So, so this is just an example that, uh, um, you know, um, you, can, you can actually do uh, things quite uh, efficiently. Uh, you run several algorithms, you get a predictor, you know, looks good, that you should be happy. Um, relatively simple problem. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to survey um, uh, this, uh, um, how to use uh, uh, RL uh, to uh, make hierarchical decisions and um, I think there is a, an interesting message uh, here. So uh, uh, this is from the point of view of the TSO. Uh, the TSO works in, uh, in multiple time scales. So it works in time scale of minutes. So it monitor what's happening in the grid and react very quickly. As in give a call to, uh, to someone and say, you know, time to, uh, uh, to turn the, the boiler on. Um, you need to uh, plan generation uh, days in advance, whether day ahead or a few days ahead. You need to play maintenance, that's months in advance, so you know, between uh, in, in July and, Ju and, and August, a particular line is going to be down for maintenance. And you need to, uh, uh, to plan the network development, as in 
we're going to build a power line between point A and point B. Um, so this, is, this has always been the case, but with uh, renewable energy, it only becomes worse. And the reason it's going to become worse, or it, it has been becoming worse, is that, well, monitoring and reacting, there is, you know, it is what it is, but the, it's because of the variability in production, uh, planning the generation days in advance can become uh, quite challenging, and because of that, planning the, play, uh, planning the maintenance, because you just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the, the different thing about that, the difference between, uh, um, you know, there is a definition, the definition of hell is, uh, uh, or no electricity, that a cold day, no wind, and uh, uh, cloudy, right? If that happens, we need a lot of storage. So, so ba basically, um, uh, this, those problems are only going to be exasperated by in the introduction of intermittent uh, energy sources. So, I, I'm going to talk uh, now about, uh, about uh, outage scheduling from the TSO perspective. So basically, uh, what the TSO uh, can do is that, well, they have different time scales. So in, in terms of month, uh, and month ahead, they can do simulation, and then the day uh, um, can be, um, every day uh, uh, is you open into, say, 24-hour uh, uh, windows. You can do redispatch, re load shedding, and wind curtailment. You can do the three time horizons uh, that are uh, relevant. We omit the years uh, uh, for, pla for uh, uh, asset planning. So what do you need to do? You need to find an optimal outage scheduling solution, which looks something like that, right? Asset one uh, can be, uh, uh, will, will, can you put it online month one, asset, you know, whatever, at month two and so forth. Uh, you need to consider, in this case, we only consider transmission lines. Uh, this is work with a, a TSO. Um, and um, uh, the slots are uh, once a month and, uh, and basically the main maintenance um, um, depends on the asset uh, age. So when you think about the problem, this is a mathematical problem that you want to solve. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details, but you have this, uh, the, this you want to find uh, uh, UM. This is your monthly, uh, uh, the monthly maintenance policy. But then you also need to consider, this is all, all sort of probabilistic uh, uh, constraints, that's important, but this is uh, the scheduling problem and this is the real time problem. And you need, so you need to basically, whenever you solve this optimization problem, to also solve the, the, the inner problem, and for solving uh, the inner problem of the, the daily scheduling, you need to solve the real time problem. So you have a right of three levels of problems, and you know, at this point you should give up, right? Because, I mean, you're not going to solve it. Um, uh, so certainly if you're not going to view it as an optimization problem. Uh, and, and just one, one thing about the state space, uh, um, I mean, if you want to think about this as, as, a, as, a, as an IRL problem, then you have uh, the, the, the time, you have the, you know, the, the maintenance problem, the day ahead uh, demand, uh, and you have the supply, the real time, and so forth. But, but this is really not, not when, when the operator uh, works in real time, I mean, they don't care about what happened in the day ahead. They just want to solve, uh, to solve the, the real-time problem. And when the operator works in the day ahead, they don't care about the fact that there is, you know, that somebody told, said that there is, is going to be a, a particular maintenance operation. They just want to solve the, the scheduling uh, uh, problem. So the issue is really that uh, uh, in, in, in different uh, time horizons, you, you need to have, uh, you need to, you see different things. And, and this is sort of, um, you know, from a monthly perspective, things can be smooth, and then in the daily perspective, uh, they're a bit less smooth, and in the real time, they're even much, much less smooth. And those are very different problems. Um, so the point of the whole exercise is to do a hierarchical division. So you, we divide the state space, and then we solve the problems uh, independently. Okay, so the inner decisions, um, basically, we have the short-term unit commitment problem. And uh, that's uh, the pro trying to minimize uh, the cost given the monthly uh, decision. And then there is a real-time uh, redispatch uh, uh, problem, which is uh, you, given the day ahead decisions, uh, try to solve, uh, uh, solve it based on, on, uh, on realizations. Okay. All right, so you can solve, try to solve all of that, do Monte Carlo, run many simulations, and hope for the best. That's one approach. That's not a good approach because, well, you know, if the grid is not tiny, you will not be able to solve anything. Okay, so what is our idea? The idea is to use what we call proxies. 
So what is the proxy? Instead of solving the optimization problem, I just need to know that in real time somebody will be able to solve it. Okay, so we, we call that a proxy. So I, I develop a, a machine learning approach that will tell me what the solution is, uh, or to be more, more precise, what the value of the solution is. I don't need to solve it. I just need to know it's solvable and more or less what the value is. We call that uh, the decision proxy. Because instead of simulating real time, and instead of simulating uh, the day ahead, we can, we're, now it's, it's enough for us to, uh, uh, just to uh, uh, build this machine learning uh, uh, tool, and we can use supervised learning for that. OK. So the short-term proxy, we use KNN. Uh, after uh, some uh, uh, 2D, uh, uh, 2D mapping, um, it more or less looks like that. Uh, you can get confidence in that, and it, uh, you can think about it also as a cold start. Uh, for deep learning attempts. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, KNN is good enough uh, to solve a short, uh, short uh, term problem. And remember that we can simulate. So it's not that we, we're not allowed to simulate. We just don't want to simulate a million times. We're happy with simulating just you know, 100,000 times. And the, re and, and, and the rest, 900,000 times, machine learning is going to do the work for us. And the real time proxy, um, I, I mean, we wanted to basically uh, predict uh, um, the LPF uh, uh, fields. Um, we, we did a neural network uh, um, uh, here. Uh, basically, uh, the, the, we got 1% uh, of, the, of the samples we got wrong, uh, and less than 1% uh, in, in cost. And we, we, we eventually, uh, we have uh, um, uh, between actually four to five order of magnitude speed ups uh, with proxies. And that's important to understand. Uh, optimizing uh, the, I mean, the real issue is that we, when you simulate a, a power flow, eventually it's five minutes power flow. But you don't want to do that. You don't need to do that if you know that the power flow will be solved. So if all that you care about is avoiding blackouts uh, or avoiding very high costs, uh, what you really need to, to do is you need a real-time proxy that is, would be good and you need a, um, you need, uh, uh, and for that, you, you need uh, uh, the day ahead proxy. Uh, so, yeah. Can you explain again this US and US, the two binaries, separate binaries in your proxy? Yes. So, um, US, that's your, I mean, your control is based on the, your monthly, your, the scheduling, and the real time. So, scheduling for me, it's unit commitment, so I think uh, that's a day ahead. So, so you need, your control has to be uh, essentially a plan for the next, say, half a year. Then for every month, you need a plan for every day. And then for every day, you need a plan for every hour or even to go all the way to real time. So what we're saying is that, I mean, you can do that, but simulation is going to be too expensive here. Uh, so what we, we propose to do is to replace, say, the real time with some, a machine that takes data into account. The grid doesn't change much. I mean, it changes, but not much. Take the grid topology into account and, and outputs uh, an evaluation, an estimation of the cost. Uh, and the same for the, for the scheduling, for the hierarchy of the, of the, of the day ahead. So basically, uh, what, we're, you know, what you're buying is that you, you're, you're paying in, in worse, uh, in worse uh, 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 accuracy, but you're, you're, you're buying a higher uh, uh, much, much lower uh, computational complexity. Yeah? But if you change the monthly action, for example, you are scheduling a generator for maintenance, yeah. then your entire database is not useful. Exactly. Right? Right. So you retrain. You retrain. Okay. Exactly. And, and the, the, you retrain, but you have a good warm start because you don't think ch things change too much, right? I mean, um, Okay, so, so um, I want to talk a little bit briefly now about explainable AI. This is a recent paper that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, we published, uh, and, and I think it's important to do that in, in, in the current, uh, uh, in this current stage. Uh, I think explainable AI has a lot uh, to offer to us. So, um, so in traditional ML models, uh, we have a, a black box model, say a deep network, and we don't know why it works. In explainable models, well, we have to we want to understand why the model did what it did. We want to gain trust, at least sometimes. We don't have to always trust it, but 
when we want to know when we can trust it. And then if there is a mistake, we know that we, how, how to correct it. So this is the uh, um, um, explainable AI. And this is, the question is, of course, how to, how to do it. Um, so this is an example for, uh, um, um, I think it's uh, um, some uh, um, prediction problem. Uh, and then uh, what you see here is that we built some network, uh, caricature of a network. There are so, some input features um, that are written here. And, and the question is whether or not what we would do, well, we would get something like saying, you know, temperature supports prediction. Um, the cooling low supports prediction. Uh, the flow rate supports somewhat. And then uh, the on-off status does not support much. Uh, this will be a kind of explanation. Okay, we'll tell you what correlates with your decision, what supports. Would you buy that an, ex an explanation? Right? So, so, right? Not very happy about that, but this is what we know how to do. Okay. So there are two types of explanation. There are intrinsic explanation where we build a model that intrinsically gives us a good explanation, like decision tree. Uh, that's great. If only it would work. If only it would work, we would love to use this approach. Um, the problem is that, you know, usually algorithms that have, uh, uh, are intrinsically explainable give poor performance. And that's just, you know, I don't know why. That's probably the preservation of bad luck. On the other hand, what is commonly done is that you have an input and output system. Uh, and then you, what you build it. This is the black box. And then after everything is said and done, uh, you build uh, an explanation. So then you build an explainability. Uh, there is an explainability algorithm that tells you what to do. And this is uh, often done what we call uh, using what, something that we call distillation. And distillation, um, what you could do is you can take the model here, the input output model, and you basically, to build it, you had so much data, right? Maybe a, 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 a hundred thousand samples. But if I give you them all and I, I tell you, generate as much data as you like, well, now you can generate an infinite amount of data for all, all, all that matters. And now I can build an, a, a model that explains it that is simpler than the ML model that is ex an explainable model. For example, a tree. That's called distillation. But there is another approach, which is pretty common, pretty common in the, in the community too, called Lime or Shap. I will talk about Lime. Lime is uh, known as uh, local interpretable model agnostic explanations. The idea is, I think, very simple. Um, you take a, a problem that you want, uh, you, you want to make, to give an explanation for a particular instance. So not for your whole model, but just for one particular decision that you've made. Uh, you select uh, what, what, you, what you like to, uh, uh, what you like to, uh, uh, to have achieved. You perturb your data set and you get black box uh, Prediction for the perturbation. You weigh uh, the new samples uh, according to the proximity to the interest that you actually care about. You train a simple model, say a linear model, uh, that you can explain well uh, on the data set. And then you, you interpret the local model. So I'll explain here with, with an equation. There is a particular x that I want to explain. So I look at the, at the loss, say the mean square error, of my black box model, f, which was good. Uh, and here I'm, I'm minimizing over simple models. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the pi x is a proximity, uh, proximity measure. So what it, it tells me that, you know, I'm going to build a model here. This model is, say, going to be linear, like simple model, linear with maybe three non-zero taps. And um, it's going to approximate uh, my function, uh, the, 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 the black box function, as, as much as possible. And, uh, and, and if that's something that, uh, and this, this is something that is, is commonly done, it's uh, done automatically. Uh, you have it in Python, uh, in, in scikit-learn even. Uh, so this is something that you do. And, and if you, you choose a linear or linear family uh, a model, then it's, it's pretty easy. Okay. There is something called CHAP, which is based on coalitions. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into this, but you should if you're looking to do something which, which is with explainable AI, you should definitely uh, do Shaft. The idea is uh, similar to Lime, but it allows uh, multiple features to sort of work together to form a coalition. Um, and and that, that's a pretty neat idea, but we don't have time uh, for that now. 
So just in terms of uh, XAI for energy, um, this is, uh, those are applications that uh, uh, from the last uh, three years, uh, renewable is about 20% of the applications. Uh, and here is uh, um, the zoo of, the, of technologies. You see that uh, um, grand boosting um, is about uh, 40%, uh, and then there are all sort of other techniques that are using uh, this, that, and, and, and the other. So, so basically about half of the techniques for, uh, uh, in energy for explainable AI use um, uh, something like, uh, like uh, um, XGBoost or Random Forest, and then everything else is quite uh, diverse. Uh, I should mention that in terms of explainability itself, intrinsic, is, uh, intrinsic explanations are relatively rare, rightfully so. Uh, most people use Shaplime or DeepShap. DeepShap is uh, another version of uh, Shap, and others are just uh, other, other approaches. And, and there are other approaches uh, that are uh, coming online. So the X, uh, different XAI uh, models are used and are used quite uh, successfully. Okay. So now, let's talk about market. So far, we haven't mentioned the word market in this talk. So if you take markets into account, for example, the wind forecasting in markets, the effect that it has is huge. Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at the market size of, say, I won't take you know, Denmark because wind here is huge and also it's very well connected, but, uh, but in markets when, when, where wind is important, it's very important. It affects the head, it affects uh, the operating day itself, it affects uh, the real time. Even the error in the wind, estimating how much error we, we may have is a, a significant aspect because uh, the operator needs to account, whether implicitly or explicitly, to account for the uncertainty in the production. Okay, so uh, um, um, in power markets, uh, uh, um, I mean, you can try to do price uh, uh, prediction you can think about how it would relate to game theory. You, think about, you can think about multiple time horizons. Uh, of course, markets are highly non-stationary. The markets change all the time. They're cyclical because of, uh, of, uh, of uh, wind, uh, uh, wind patterns and solar patterns, but also because of gas prices. And, and perhaps most importantly, there is not much data. And that's a point which is, you know, people don't realize how much little data you have for markets. The reason is that if you look at you know, gas price today and gas prices two years ago, completely different world. I mean, today gas prices are uh, um, four or five times higher than they used to be, completely different world. Even the market itself changed just, be, just, be, just by virtue of having uh, more or less uh, renewable energy or, or, uh, or storage. So, uh, to, so, you know, I gave you all those warnings, but now it's, it's time for shameless uh, self-promotion. Um, you can ask whether machine learning can be used for power markets, so the answer is yes. And in fact, trading is a real business, both here uh, in Europe, in the States. Um, it used to be in Australia until uh, a few days ago. Uh, there are different instruments, and they, they require different uh, types of machine learning. Uh, there are day ahead markets uh, that are basically looking at the next operating day. Uh, there are uh, financial tr transmission rights that look at uh, months, even years into the future. There are derivative in ICE and other markets. Um, so there are different instruments. The, the machine learning plays a, a, a major role there. It's perhaps the most major role. And the most, the most important problem, or, or you can ask, well, why don't you predict the price and be done with it? So the issue is that uh, price is extremely nonlinear in the demand uh, and supply curve. So the difference between having, a, um, having a, um, uh, you know, one or two gigawatts of difference uh, can be the difference between a negative price and a, a, cap, a max cap uh, uh, price. And we are seeing that all over the place. And if you want to know more, um, you, can, you can ask me uh, uh, later. So just to conclude this whole uh, uh, three hours, uh, um, three hours uh, uh, um, talk, um, data, uh, data rule, and the more, if anything, you, if you, you have to get from it, just get more data uh, and get better data. Uh, you need to worry about your process, you need to know what you're doing, what is your test, what is your validation, what is your data, how is your data clean, why it's not clean, you need, you need to figure out uh, if your process is correct. In terms of algorithms, as I said, you don't need to write any more algorithms at this point. You can choose a framework, you can choose the algorithm according to uh, 
um, to, what, uh, uh, to what works for you. And emulate. If you do not emulate, I do not trust what you're telling me. And personally, I would reject any paper that I get without a proper emulation, just based on data, just because I don't believe that people can, would not overfit, even if the, it is a neural network in their brain that does the overfitting. And if you have any more questions, you can contact me in other of those emails. With that, I would conclude. Thank you for your time. How are we doing with time? Maybe, maybe I have 10 minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Professor. In, in your opinion, what's the difference between uh, interpretability and uh, explainability? Because I've seen people say, okay, decision trees are interpretable, but they are not uh, explainable. Or there is some sort of confusion between the the terms. So a model is, uh, let's say, uh, let's say random forest could be only be explainable, but they will never be interpretable. So in, what's your personal uh, view on this? I don't think there's a real difference. To me, they're just, you know, whatever makes you convince uh, your client. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah. I think many people here, they have, they have power system background. So let's try to have a um, summary of the applications you said. So one is prediction of demand, P, I don't know, solar, whatever, that's obvious applications for machine learning. Uh, I think everyone agrees. Then you talked about applications for your commitment. Yeah. So I suppose you use this to accelerate the computational work, right? right? right. That's, that's to enable, in fact. I mean, you would not be able to do anything without it. And at the end there, you talked about uh, trading applications, yeah. even Right. And you mentioned about this machine learning, but which technique you specifically are going to use for training and for market design? Is it reinforcement learning or are you going to start with something else first? Yeah. So, so you need, I mean, in, in trading, the real aspect is risk. Because risk is, uh, I mean, getting, being able to trade and make money most of the time is easy, but not to lose money on average, that's more difficult. So it, you need to hedge your, uh, hedge your risk. So it's not enough to predict. You need to forecast and to have a, uh, an understanding of the, of the whole forecasting uh, itself. As I said, because the non-linearities. Um, so you know, the precise techniques, well, that's for me to know uh, and for you to, I can tell you, but then I have to kill you. Uh, but, uh, but mostly, um, in most trading, uh, it, it, you have to do a lot of, uh, to consider the dynamics very seriously. So whether it's reinforcement learning or, or simulating dynamic process, um, that's a different story, but you need to simulate and focus on the risky areas. But how can you make your machine learning algorithm risk averse? Yeah, so, so there is a whole business of robust uh, reinforcement learning and risk averse reinforcement learning. Uh, those, are, are, those relate to simulation theory. Um, and there is a whole, like, you know, we can give three hours on that uh, uh, easily, maybe next time. Uh, but uh, but uh, um, the point of the exercise is that you don't really know what's the distribution, and uh, you will never know. Like you don't you don't think that it's possible to know even be just because of shortage of data. As I said, I mean, one year of market data is more than you would expect uh, uh, to have. Um, so uh, you need to not look at the distribution that you estimate, but at the family of distribution that makes it. That's what you're robust against. You're robust against multiple. Uh, multiple uh, distributions. So yeah, robust and risk averse uh, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I have another question. Thanks a lot for your presentation once again. Um, in uh, one of the simulations or in this hierarchical framework that you show involving the planning problem, the short term operations problem, as well as the real time uh, problem. And I think, if I understand correctly, we don't only use machine learning to forecast the objective function value, but also the optimal solution. Right. And for instance, for the planning problem, while you're trying to, for instance, get a surrogate for the unit commitment problem, mm -hmm. say, did you, um, for instance, run into cases where, for instance, the machine learning model did a prediction that is not physically yes. implementable? Yes, yeah. of course. So you, you get, in fact, 
uh, what you need to do, and I haven't, didn't have the time to describe it, you need to um, figure out when you are, go I mean, it's not that you never simulate, you just want to simulate an order or two orders of magnitude less frequently. Uh, so initially you, you have to simulate, and then you get, a, you, get a, you get a confidence. And when this confidence is low, you will simulate anyway because you don't trust. And sometimes, uh, it, and it's, even after you do all that, you still have some percentage of mistake. And you can estimate this percentage because it, machine learning uh, tells you something. And you can still solve it. And then you can estimate how far you are from, uh, uh, from being able to perfectly not, not do the job that you, you, you need to do. Um, so as I said, I think uh, like you, get, you can get within 1% or even less, but the 1% that you don't get is a costly one. Okay, so this is uh, where things are, uh, I mean, where you, and where things, bad things are happening uh, uh, potentially to the grid. So you need to be a bit careful about, uh, about how, uh, how you do things. I should mention that in this particular operation, the system operator, um, I mean, the reason that they even consider working with us is that uh, they don't have any other way to solve the problem. I mean, it's not like they will have a, 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 a farm with, you know, 6,000 uh, CPUs running. I mean, they, they're willing to have maybe 60, uh, not 6,000. They don't have the money for that, and I think that's pretty common uh, in many system operators all, all over the world. They're not very rich. Yeah. Thanks again for the presentation. I just want to ask, uh, how do you realize you have to retrain the model when the system is changed? You are just looking the predictions, or with the just looking for the futures, can you understand whether mm -hmm. I have to train it again? Or not? Yeah. So, so th this is a, a whole branch in machine learning of uh, trying to figure out when I need to retrain. And in principle, one approach is to basically look at your prediction and see that there were the deterioration. Another approach is that uh, um, you have your model. But you run, you keep on the side, keep training another model uh, all, all the time, a uh, simpler model, cheaper one. And once uh, you see that the, the cheaper model, just because it trains on, on, on more recent data, becomes you know, too good in some respect, then you, will, you figure out that something, something is happening here. Uh, and that's usually what, 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 uh, the practical solution that people, uh, people are doing. And you can prove it's a pretty good solution. Like it's, it, 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 and it works, it, it, may, it works well. Um, I should mention that um, um, some, something that often, often happens is that uh, there is a gradual uh, decline. So basically your model is, starts well, and then it's, you know, it drops off. And the drop is, is, is gentle, but then when you realize that there is a drop, then it, it might be too late. Uh, and, and, and really it can be a quite adverse, uh, adverse moment. Um, also, there is a cyclical issue. So winter is different than summer, is different than, than fall, um, and then uh, you need to and you need to account for that. Sometimes you do pre you, you do the training or retraining on a scheduled uh, basis. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have a question okay. about chat. So Sharpie means that all we all together, we are the same goals, we get earn one hundred dollars. So the question is that how to redistribute it based on our individual contributions. So so Shai, how are you gonna use uh Shafi value if you say very short? Yeah, I I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention. So yeah. so so the idea of the following. Uh, sometimes you have features that are surrogate to each other. So they contain almost the same information. Maybe not precisely the same, but the essence is the same. So, so the question in chat is, or oh, the reason that um, coalitions uh, are relevant here is that, let's suppose that there are some features that are, you know, they contain the same information, but not, not precisely, but, but the same, almost the same information. So, so now you ask, well, this feature, feature number seven, is it more important than feature number six? Because I know that they carry the same information. So I ask, well, Suppose I'm going to take seven, uh, seven away. Then what will happen? How much will, will things deteriorate? And, and if they deteriorate by essentially nothing, then seven is not important. Its information is contained in other features. But on the other hand, if seven is, is important enough so that there is a, a marked uh, um, uh, deterioration, then basically I'm going to include, uh, I'm going to include uh, uh, seven and give it, um, I'm going to give it the, the, the relative Shapley, Shapley value. Um, so what, what the, the point of the, 
I mean, in a linear model, which is uh, what Lime is usually doing, everything is very simple. But once you, in, in a linear model, if you have two features that are essentially exchangeable, you can get everything between, everything goes to feature number one, everything goes to feature number two, and everything in between. So it wouldn't mean much if I tell you, you know, feature number six and number seven are really important. Uh, or I don't know how much important. You want to know which one is more important. And, the sh and, and, and using SHAP that gives, solves you this problem, it tell, it's, going, it's going to tell you, you can use six, you can use seven, they're relatively important, or you can even tell you that six and seven are the same. Just pick one. And it's your, going to be your decision which one to pick. Black box machine learning becomes exactly, somewhat at least, or more, more interpretable. Yeah. It's a very popular algorithm, by the way. It's, uh, it's used, uh, I mean, if, like, if you ask me, you know, I have a problem, I, I cannot tell you what it is, but how sh what should I do uh, to, get, to provide interpretability, I'll tell you, use chat. Yeah, sure, sorry. Um, if one, one question uh, regarding those explainability methods too. Um, how can you evaluate um, those explanations? Like if the line um, method gives me a completely different explanation than the sharp um, method, for example, is there a way to determine which explanation is more correct? Um, maybe there is. A, I'm not aware of, of such. So, so basically, um, it's uh, completely theological slash heuristic slash uh, you know, discussion. The one only thing I can tell is that you can emulate to figure out whether you find the right explanation, but that's you know, not solving the problem that you actually want to solve, but solving another problem that is you know, perhaps similar statistically, but, but yeah. So I, I'm not aware of that. And that's, by the way, a major criticism uh, uh, of, the, of this whole field of XAI. Uh, there are metrics, but they look kind of made up and um, and, uh, and, uh, and artificial. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, in one of the slides, when people showed that you were solving a good optimization problem in which some optimization variable was also the solution of another optimization problem, mm -hmm. which was shown by two last constraints. Yeah. So you propose that we can solve these two uh, constraints, or let's say the decision variables of this uh, constraint by a neural network and you call it proxy. Yeah. So then, uh, how do you use this solution? Yeah, you will have a neural network that if you use something to feature, it will give you the new values. Right. So how do you plug it in the original optimization mm -hmm. problem? So the way you should think about it is the following. Uh, uh, the person who, who needs to decide on this monthly uh, solution, he, they, they don't care about the local solution. That, that, I mean, they don't need to know the real-time so solution. They just need to know that it will be solved in real time. And, this, and they need to have, to have a, a good approximation of the, of the cost in real time. But they don't need to solve it in real time. And, uh, so, so the way it works is that you solve everything by one big happy gradient type uh, uh, algorithm. Um, whether, I mean, depending on exact definitions, whether it's a gradient or meta heuristic, but let's call it a gradient algorithm. It's a local algorithm. And then to do the steepest descent, for a given configuration, you can solve everything, right? If I give, tell you uh, which assets are going to be offline, you can solve the day ahead. If I, if I tell you the day ahead, you can solve the real time. All I'm saying, instead of solving it, just use the proxy. To, uh, to, and, and that's it, basically. And by saying that it is solvable, it means that somehow you are checking the feasibility. Exactly. It will be feasible or the, uh, uh, in, in real time. That's what we're saying, eventually. It's create a simulation model that is, is in the same complexity level as the model that, you, that you ha you're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you say my data come from a, a mixture of Gaussians with you know, three components, um, and you know, that's fine. And you want to say, well, can I learn it even? That, that's sort of the, can I learn it with you know, 100 samples? It's a difficult question. I don't know the answer. So for that, I'm going to tell you, look, simulate 100 models with three Mixture, mixture, mixture of three Gaussians, 
estimate the parameters, see if the parameters are close to what you've done, and tell me if you're happy with the performance. If the answer is no, then you should not try to, fi to fit a mixture of three Gaussians. Let's say you have the decisions of inner, deci inner decisions from proxies. How do you uh, put them in the uh, upper level co uh, complete problem, which is on optimization? Yeah, so for, think about it like that. For every solution, every UM, uh, I can give, com compute a, a cost function and violation probability. Yeah. Okay, so I, I I'll give you one solution. I can use a proxy to compute uh, uh, those. I, I can now modify my solution greedily, and I have another solution, and I can keep going. Uh, maybe you can leave the proxies a slide. Can maybe sure. Yeah. Yes. So at the end, you need to solve this optimization problem. So that, this one? Yeah, so number one. Right, 1A. One so yeah, yeah, one uh, A to N. Yes. So you need to uh, model this solution of uh, proxies be to have one E and one F. Right. So, uh, but they are not linear, so you cannot put it there. Uh, at the end, there are two neural networks, let's say, or two different machines. Right, but everything is, 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 uh, is, is, is differentiable. Yeah, how do you solve this minimization problem? Gre I, with a gra gra grad descent. Uh, I just saw, yeah. I, I don't, I saw it with a gradient. I mean, I don't need anything else. I, you have the grant because this, uh, this is, uh, uh, those are, I mean, you have them as, as you know, either as, as proxies which you can query and get a response, mm -hmm. or as, as a, a, new, a network themselves, and then, then you can put it inside this very happy large gradient. Uh -huh. So at the end, one is uh, also a machine learning algorithm? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, oh, well, it's an, it's an optimization. I mean, maybe not sure if there is a difference at this stage between machine learning and optimization. I mean, you are minimizing your uh, expected values. You know, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, in your opinion, what is the next level of machine learning techniques? Is it um, more computing uh, uh, power, or is it uh, better techniques? Or like, what's the next level of research in machine learning? So, so, so to me, um, I mean, first I don't know. Had I known, I, <laughs> but but I, I would have uh, worked on it. Uh, I think that, though, uh, at least my my sense is that it's about uh, um, injecting power and knowledge efficiently, uh, and and I think that's uh, not an easy one. So it's not. It will take some time and some effort, but. Uh, uh, injecting prior knowledge to a decision, whether it's a decision problem or forecasting or classification or regression, that seems like a very difficult uh, part. Uh, um, it, not just for explainability sake, but even just for the sake of being able to solve problems. And you can see what is happening with self-driving cars. Uh, I think uh, you know, lots of, uh, of people thought that it would be solved, would have been solved, should have been solved uh, a few years ago. Uh, but still, it's not solved. So the question is why it's not solved, because you know, after all, I think probably most of the people here drive, drive a car. And you know, so it's not it's, this, just putting common sense or putting a, a prior knowledge, which I think are kind of the same thing, efficiently and in a, methodo a methodical uh, manner, I think that's a, it's a big challenge. Um, and th that, that's, I think, where much of the community uh, is heading. I do note that, I mean, if you go and talk to, to a system operator, they know a lot of things about how to solve such problems. I mean, you know, they have those uh, guys that are using Excel to run those asset management, and, and, and they're doing a good job. I mean, it's not like they're doing an awful job. This is super fancy. Uh, you don't, maybe you, we don't need to go that, to that level of, of super fanciness. Maybe what we do need is to be able to to have those people um, explain why they do what they do uh, and elicit from them uh, uh, insights uh, into our, eventually, we'll trust our optimization problem, but we need to probably talk, talk to them. So to me, um, injecting prior knowledge is, is, uh, is really where the future uh, is. And prior knowledge can come in different shapes and forms. So it can come in terms of, uh, like, like from statements in text to uh, 
uh, know-how to samples to curriculum. So uh, there are lots of things that, uh, that know-how uh, is there. And I think we see that now with um, a lot of the, of, the, um, of the natural language processing models. Uh, even some people say that, you know, whatever, some, some, some AI is, uh, is sentient. Um, whatever, I, I don't want to get into that, certainly not when I'm, I'm, I'm recorded. Um, but um, um, it's certainly the case that we don't know how to inject prior knowledge, and it's certainly the case that we have a lot of prior knowledge, and it's certainly the case that machine learning and human learning evolve to be completely different things. And you know, they're going to become a little bit closer. Thanks, Thank you.